and charge leaders to help in solving the differences he has with Governor James Orengo. I'm extremely excited and uh, first I want to thank God for uh, this uh, victory and uh, importantly I equally want to thank the Senate for uh, the very fair impartial deliberations that I have had at the Senate and um, I want to assure the people of Shia that our primary calling is service to them and uh, that I'm looking forward to going back to Shia to join Governor James Orango in uh, providing effective and efficient service to the people of Shia County. I want to use both in person and I also hope to use elders and churches to help us bridge this divide. However, CIMC has blamed the Kenya Kwanzaa team for playing politics in a matter that affected residents in their county. We have confirmed, we have been vindicated here, that there is a breakage of law. The deputy governor has contravened the constitution, so them working with Orang, is it going to rectify the constitution or breach? The special committee of the Senate found the deputy governor to be culpable. What has played out in the Senate in the debate which was going on was the political game between Azimio and Kenya Kwanzaa. And it's good, we now know we as here is an ODM government. Last week, 42 MCAs accused the DG of gross violation of the constitution and gross misconduct and abuse of office. NHIF board chairman Michael Kamau says the proposal to increase monthly contributions to 2.75% is meant to achieve equity in consolidating contributions to the health fund. Speaking on a local TV station, Kamau said the low-income earners have been carrying the burden of the contributions to NHIF, hence the need to create a level playing field. 2.75 is not an increase. And you find that people below 35,000 bob, some of them were even paying up to 5%, 5% of their salary. So there was no equity. Anybody earning 100,000 and above was paying 1,700, 1,700. The only way you can create equity is to bring in a percentage. So when we worked all the averages, then we averaged it to 2.5, all the total um, uh, receipts, that is what would bring 2.75%. On matters of corruption in NHIF, Kamau said insurance providers and various hospitals that provide services through the fund have curtailed. He stated that these facilities work with NHIF officials to extort money from the government through the medical fees Kenyans use when seeking for medical services at those hospitals. Corruption in NHIF is an ongoing issue. It is something that must be cleared today, 1st of January up to 31st of December. It is a daily exercise. And you find even hospitals who are inducing people, you know, they induce demand so that they can get their money back. So corruption and uh, uh, insurance fraud is a continuous fight. And I think at NHIF I can say this, I have received uh, sufficient instructions from the appointing authority on how to tackle this issue. In his quest to actualize the UHC agenda, President William Ruto is now seeking to compel salaried workers to pay 2.7% of their gross monthly income to the health scheme, with those who are self-employed be compelled to remit 2.75% of their declared or assessed gross monthly income. A report released by the Auditor General has blown the lead on massive corruption, malpractice and poor management in water and sanitation companies across various counties. The report, which has been adopted by the Senate Public Investment Committee, revealed that private companies, in collaboration with corrupt county officials, have been engaging in malpractices and embezzling the 47 counties in excess of 47 billion shillings in lost revenue. Some of the counties that have been flagged for malpractice and embezzlement include Wajir, Muranga, Nairobi, and Taita counties. And in the international scene, Ukraine says its forces have regained control of the southeastern village of R- Riznopil as they continue to advance against Russian forces after launching a counter-offensive. The village appeared to be the ninth recaptured by Ukraine this month in the early stages of an offensive in which Ukrainian officials have signaled that the main push is yet to come. That's the Newswire. I'm Lea Obaga. Spice FM Kisumu
The following takes place from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. every weekday on Spice FM. Good morning, and I love your show. Thank you. <laughs> Having come from Bakikuyu radio background, I migrated to Spice <laughs> because of the content. I was born in a slum, but somehow I got a break in life. So sometimes when you see the sweating coming out because of the passion and whatever it is, <laughs> <laughs> behind the noise, there are people. And we share the same umbilical cord. It shouldn't be like that. I am so disappointed. We used to tell uh, Honda Boraila Molotinga that he's doing police of conmanship. And even President Uhuru Kenyatta, Srikali, he you gonna conmanship your earlier you. You cannot promise people that you reduce tax, then you double. In politics, mm. there is uh, the issue of trust. Mm. For you to turn around and then stab the same people who gave you that trust, there is no other level of dishonesty. The situation. What does it look like on these Nairobi streets? A little bit of traffic starting to build up on Jogoro this morning. And we're also seeing it coming in slightly heavy on the northern bypass. It'll spill over towards Kambu Road in a bit, getting out towards Muthaiga Square. Uh, but you should be fine getting into the city at least for now. Tuesday is not starting off too badly, but we're likely to see busyness as the day progresses. Where are you this morning? Everybody kicking it off and starting this a new day. Let's see what's in store. Let us know what's going on where you are. In an attempt to keep things moving this Tuesday, talk to us on Spice FM, KE on Twitter. Spice FM, Nieri. This is the Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, an Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. Eight minutes this after six. is the Good situation morning and room. Welcome to Tuesday, 27th day of June 2023. Ati, today is Manda Mano Day. No, no, no. Today, today uh, is a Manda Mano Day. What is it? Rally Day. Oh, it's a rally. And not Safari Rally. Uh, rally Day. This is the other one. <laughs> is the other one? The other one, yes. Yeah, safari. Uh, that has just ended. Uh, that huh? was won by Ogier. Mm. Yes. Today they are calling it Rally. Today they are calling it Rally in Kamkunji. So it's just going to be contained. <laughs> I hope so. Not public. It's just Rally. I hope so. Okay. We One can only hope. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. Okay. We have a guest host today. <laughs> Wangari Mwikia, <laughs> economist. Good morning. Good morning. How's it? Pleasure to be here hmm? with you all. How was it waking up that early in the morning? It wasn't that bad, actually. For Some you, reason, my system likes to wake up earlier than most. You're used to these things? Yeah. I don't know what it is. I, mean, I feel like uh, insomnia is, is creeping into my old bones. Ah, refuse it all. I know. Do I agree? <laughs> What's that? Tonku Bali. No, 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 please. What's that? Yeah. So what time do you normally sleep? Usually I sleep by 9, 10. If it's a really bad day, I sleep at 11. Okay. But my body just wants to wake up at like 2. It wakes up at 2. What? I don't know why. You I, sleep I, at 10, you diet. wake up at 2. I don't know what it is. <clears throat> and then I, I don't go to bed. My mm. body doesn't want to go to bed until now 5, when it's time to wake up. Uh, mm. It's not that. What, what is, is it? it? Please, it's not help me. This place you live in. Mm. <laughs> What's wrong with you guys? I'm my sister, I'm Aisha. Is it near cemetery? <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> visitors. Yeah. yeah. Maybe she has not appeased the visitors. Yeah. So. You sound like you want to do a seance. I know. I'm like uh, <laughs> looking at you like, which visitors are you talking about? <laughs> really? people. There are those who explain it this way. They say mm. the subconscious never sleeps. Mm. So. If there are many things you're mulling over and they're unresolved, 
and you sort of like think they are gone. Mm. All you've done is push them to the subconscious. So come night time when you're supposed to be asleep, the subconscious regurgitates them mm. and starts working on them. I find that to be absolutely true but I do a, I usually do a, a review when I wake up and I'm stressed I'm like what is it that's stressing me last night there was nothing stressing me but now when you start thinking you will you not sleep yeah, 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 yeah I guess yeah, yeah. that is the problem so when you wake up stop thinking just zoob mm. you'll fall back asleep <laughs> and start now at analyzing the mm. day but what happened mm. but what was i supposed to be doing tomorrow mm. but anyway welcome wangari we uh, look forward to having an engaging time with you today city mm. what happened we when? see your cheeks now yes so yesterday we had guests here yesterday who were basically talking about CT and uh, you know his white gray beard mm. and so you decided that's too much talk. Now remove the whole thing. <laughs> no, no, no 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 this is it's too much attention. No this is a peace offering. Two? I don't live alone. Oh. Yes. <laughs> uh-huh. So there was sufficient pressure. Yes, let's say that um <coughs> the people who I work for mm. <laughs> um determined that um, they, they they were not fully appreciative of that caveman look. Ah. Mm. So they did this to you. No no. I was I got the message. I I've gotten the message before. Remember there was a time when I was unwell. Yeah. And mm. my barber was brought yeah. to the hospital mm. and mm. I thought he was going to do what he normally does. Mm. <laughs> he had a different brief. That guy removed all my hair on my yeah, head. Nothing you can do about it. Yes. No prompting. That woman no. is very intelligent. So <laughs> these days I have understood yeah. when I, there's a mention I understand the mention mm. and I'm the one who takes action and you get the message. So now as you can see I've taken the action. Very good. Mm. So you went to your barber. I went to another barber. Mm. The barber I'm used to yeah. also does his own thing. I tell him what I want and by the end of the day I'm asking <laughs> Danny, what brief. did I tell you I want? So now you've gone to your new barber. I've got a new barber. Please mm. do not say where this barber is. Why? Because those are people mm. are the ones who go behind your back. <laughs> <laughs> and give a different brief. Want a pen for one one? Yes. They <laughs> <laughs> give a di- don't say. <laughs> don't say where your baba is. Yes. Ndu. Yeah. It's good to have you back. Thank you. How are you feeling? I'm good. That's it. Um I'm very good, thank you. <laughs> 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 But how are you feeling today? I'm all right, you know. Meaning all right as in There's some wind in my sails today. Uko yesterday at, there was none. Uko mm. at least uh, <laughs> that one. Niko at least. You got least. Unasikia nafu. Nafu. Kidogo. Today okay. I can get up and walk and move. Mm. Uh, we are fine. Just said you could not get up and walk and move. I was there was no wind in my sails at all. Mm. Wow. Mm. Wow. Eric, how are you? You know, you're you're the asking the how are you question. Let me ask yeah. you. How are you? Mm. How are you Eric? I am okay. Just But, okay. Yeah. Comme c'est comme ça ou très bien? Ah, comme c'est comme ça. Très bien, bwana is an a whole story, bwana. Mm. Give me some couple millions. Ça va être très très bien. My friend. <laughs> hey, my friend. So yesterday I went straight home. Uh, you had promised you're going to do that. Straight home. Change into your pajamas. Straight into the bedroom. Uh-huh. Change to the my pajamas. Drew the curtains, got Out. into bed, uh. slept. You had already had a full day of work. Eh? Till today? No. See, the people I work, I work for came to <laughs> disturb me at 1.30. <laughs> <laughs> no, your employers <laughs> want to determine what happens in your life. <laughs> yes. At 1.30. Yes. You, hey, we are leaving. <laughs> Two years ago. <laughs> no, no, send me surely. a text. Just send me a text. What's no, what, what's whatever up? time I get up and I find you're not in the house, I'll, I'll figure out that you left. <laughs> okay? Why do you have to? <laughs> so, uh, I love so that completely disrupted my sleep. They just want to interact. Uh, want to interact. Uh, want to hear your voice. Uh, I didn't give them. I was like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. But that's what they needed. Just that's to make it. sure the guy is here. <laughs> Alive. You know I'm going to come into you. How are you? Doing? Ah. But I said I'm fine. No, no, no. That's not enough. You can't just say you're fine. Oh, what do you want me to do? Uh, you want me expound? Mm. Fafanua. Mm. I am very well. I am able. I am my children are healthy. I am healthy. My mom is good. My siblings are well. I am excited to be here. So, I've never ho- been a guest host of a show. Of anything. 
I didn't say of anything. Gosh. <laughs> oh. uh, um, the situation room. Wow. City. Wait, that was a stab to the heart. I, I don't look like I'm capable. Oh, no, you're really capable. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, new things, new things. Eh, I said at the beginning of this year, I'm going to do new things. <laughs> so the opportunity <sighs> is just in line with uh, what I want to do. So I'm excited. Hopefully after things. today, Wangari, yeah. you'll sleep some more. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> after this experience, you will sleep some more. Yeah. So let me tell you what we'll be discussing today. We have Wangari Mwiki with us from now until the end of the show at 10 a.m. At 7, we'll be joined by Harrison Gatia. He's the head of SME development at KEPSA, the Kenya Private Sector Alliance. He'll come to us so we can talk about the need to support and finance MSMEs in Kenya. At 8 a.m., let's talk about the wrangles at KEPSA and what's happening at KEPSA. This whole issue of PD, what is it? PBO. PBO, and, uh, net, mosquito nets, mm-hmm. and PBO, and, and who, who funding, and who changed, who wrote a letter to whom, memo, memo. a memo. Mm-hmm. Again, uh, <laughs> Dr. Andrew Mulua is the acting CEO of the Kenya Medical Supplies Authority, KEMSA. He was immediate former director of medical services in charge of promotive and preventive health. He'll be here with us at 8 a.m. to tell us, uh-huh, what's all this? What's happening? At 9 a.m., we talk about reparations for victims of torture will be joined by isabella obara she is the technical lead litigation and legal advice at the independent medical legal units we're live streaming the show on youtube and facebook are you online let us know where you're tuned in from after we take a look at the weather forecast we'll acknowledge your presence this is the situation room the only way to start your day Spice up your life. 14 and cloudy in Nairobi. Highs of 23 and lows of 13. We'll see 16 and cloudy conditions in Nakuru. Highs of 25 and lows of 14. 13 will be the low in a mostly cloudy area at 14. And it's 14 and cloudy in Eldoret. Highs of 24. 28 will be the high in a partly cloudy Mombasa. 23. And at 26, it's partly cloudy in Malindi. Highs of 28 and lows of 25. 19 and clear in Kisumu. Highs of 29 and lows of 19. And we'll see lows of 17 in a partly cloudy Kakamega going to highs of 28. Tuesday will be mostly cloudy in Kampala, highs of 27 and lows of 18. And 29 will be the high and mostly clear Dar es Salaam at 22. 7 and partly cloudy in Johannesburg, highs of 17. And Lagos is partly cloudy at this point, coming in to the morning, highs of 29 and lows of 25. It's mostly clear at 22 in Kinshasa, highs of 30 and lows of 21. And at 30... Round about lunchtime, Beijing is sunny, highs of 38 and lows of 26. Paris is cloudy at 15, highs of 25, and London is cloudy at 17, going to highs of 23. Monday night, cloudy in New York at 22, coming into Tuesday, highs of 26 and lows of 17. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Yes, yes, yes. Amos Freeman is tuned in from Kimilili and says, Good morning, Rafo Mudhu. Mudhu. Okay. He's tuned in from Ma- Naro Moro and says, Good morning, CT Ndu and Latif plus Wangari have a lovely show. Thank you, thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Jeffrey Okothra is tuned in from Elder. Elder must be lovely right around now. Mm. That cold, crisp, mm. brilliantly freezing How weather. Why is that lovely? It it must be so nice. I like the cold. Uh, It must be really nice. In fact, isn't that what made you sick? Look what the cold is doing to you. (laughs) No, no, it was not not the cold. Uh, General uh, malaise. uh, (laughs) Right. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Before this cold ends, I must go to Eldoret, even if it's for one. Go night, to Tumbaro. Come back, or even that. She, she hasn't there. even gone to Tigoni. I yeah. <laughs> oh, recently. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know where Tigoni is? Yes, I do. Okay. Just over the hill and far away. Around the corner. Mm-hmm. Okay. Hop, skip, and a jump. All right, carry on. Uh-huh. Yeah, Easterly direction. You need okay. to go back to Tigoni. I should. Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll do that. Mm-hmm. Um, people online this morning. 
Stanley says good morning. Tuned in. Um, keep flying high. Asante Sana. Good morning. What a wonderful team. We'll sit back and enjoy. James Mwangi, good morning to you. Naomi Kibet says good morning, Situation Room City. Word of encouragement to us students. Woke up with thesis writing and results section. I know my sister. It's not funny, man. <laughs> Matthew Lial Liala says, now NHIF is set to be increased. Well, actually, the amount you pay towards NHIF is set to be increased. NHIF, in terms of being increased, I'm not sure. Very soon, the taxes will be more than my salary. Wow. Well, mm -hmm. I hope not. <clears throat> if the government feels that we are earning so much, why don't we trade places? Ah. Assalamu alaikum from Abu Dhabi. Proverb from this side of the world. A live dog is better than a dead lion. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, welcome back, Ndu. Thank you very much. Jay says, Eric CT, Wagari Habari Zasubui, tuned in from NYC. Good morning, Situation Room, watching from Singapore. Monis Jani says, good morning. Vesh Musanga mm -hmm. is tuned in from Arusha. Good morning. Eric, yeah. how are you? CT, Ndu, Wagari. Eh? It's Wajiro. Wagari. <laughs> no, here he has written Wajiro. Uh, it's Wagari. Uh, and Edna, Wakire. Mm -hmm. It's not her second name. Mm. I get it. I get it. <laughs> Teacher Bunde says good morning. Watching from Gong Kajado. Um, <clears throat> okay, everybody comes in yesterday. Very hot and heavy. Watching from Doha. Iyenu inakwanga hat trick moja safi. Glad you update most of us far from home. Very, very glad to have you in the room, even from far away. Richard, I guess she's part of the team. Just gelling with the rest of the crew. You've seen Wagari. Mm -hmm. You've gelled already. <laughs> already. <laughs> These are signs of things to come. You should make Wangari part of the team. Have you heard? Morning to all of you. Karibu sana. That's what Paulo Chieng says. Tune in from Siaya Kababa. Hi, CT Ndu. Karibu. Thank you very much. Um, many, how, many. Good morning. Very, 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 very many. Brian, good mm. morning. Um, Bishop, good morning. Welcome back. Asante Sana. Victor Mutai, Richard Mwangi, Brian Otieno, Alex. Okay, you say, why don't we recognize you? Everybody, please say good morning to Alex and recognize him. Alex, good morning. Good morning, Alex. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Everybody, welcome to the Situation Room this morning. Karibu Sana. Karibu City. Mm. So this week we are in the current in the country whose capital is Jamen. Yes, do you are not here when we were saying this? Uh, yes, the capital is. How do you actually pronounce it? With there's an N and apostrophe, then Jame, D J Jamena. How do you pronounce it? Jamena. Jamena. Mm. Jamena. Yeah, so the N is just. It's the, like you the way you say Jerry. Exactly. Oh, Jamena and Jerry. Mm. Yes. So Jerry has a D. <laughs> Same no. way. I <laughs> let in, but present. Okay. But it's there. Uh -huh. You okay. kind of pronounce it, but you don't really pronounce mm -hmm. it, but so it's there. Wangari and Jerry has spoken. So you wouldn't <laughs> say N Jerry. N Jerry. N Jerry. N Jerry. N Jerry. There's a language. Jizz. Arabic. Mm. French. Oh, languages. I was wondering what. Uh -huh. What's jizz? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> President Muhammad. Debbie, mm -hmm. son of the other Debbie, who had gone to the war front when there was a war and he took a bullet for the team. Mm. Yes, he is now an ancestor. <laughs> okay. mm. Yes, they have a prime minister and a vice president. How about that? Oh, yes, they do. Okay. Mm. Right. Now, the proverb for the day mm. there is no such thing as a small fire or a small woman. There is no such thing as a small fire or a small, or woman. A small woman. A fire is a fire, a woman <laughs> is a woman. Full stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Same effect. Woman and fire. <laughs> wow. <laughs> this yeah. is a small and big. This <laughs> is a, a All the woman. From All China. the fire. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you look at me the way you like looking at me as though you created proverb, proverb. from Chad. Not yours. Not mine. Okay. But your selection is yours. Purely mine. <laughs> <laughs> or, or would you prefer the next one? <laughs> 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 mm. This one is good, City. Oh, like oh, it, eh? oh yeah, mm -mm. Eric likes it. Mm. This, is, this is a good one. Mm. It's clear. 
Self explanatory. Wow. Self explanatory. <laughs> Let's look at the newspaper headlines. On the front page of the standard, uh-huh. Ruto Ryla battles rescue a dwarf from the axe. Isn't it interesting how we've just now made it a Ruto Ryla affair? <laughs> And how Odwal has been saved from the gun, or rather the acts of impeachment. Mm. Okay. Malala plan to audit cabinet splits UDA. We'll tell you about that. Rivals claim victory in the Sierra Leone polls. Um, we know the election was taking place there. Um, so that's some of the stuff. Cost of loans to go up after CBK reviews margin. Surprise, surprise. On the front page of the Daily Nation, expensive loans add to tax pain as Ruto signs bill. So combine two of those stories together. Finance bill has been signed then into operation and uh, CBK is coming for you uh, in terms of costs. The Border Border story has not gone away. Good news for Border Borders in free insurance and training plan. Mm-hmm. So yay. Um, a Kenyan trader is being probed for shipping arms to Shabab. Ati, ati. Mm. Ati, ati, wait. Okay, anyway, we'll look at that story in detail. The Buddha Buddha one. Yeah, we'll tell you more about that. Ah, yeah, uh-huh. It's taken up, uh, you know, quite some on the back page of the nation today. So training, free insurance, I'll tell you a bit about that. Railways agency on the spot over disparities in SGR tender documents. Mm-hmm. You thought that had gone away? It doesn't really ever. Mm. So automated registry. Remember what we had on a uh, conversation about last week of sex offenders is finally out uh so you remain on this register if you have been convicted of a sexual offense um the register is now out and those names you remain on that for life okay life. yes mm. for life um so that has come out that's what i have on those two all righty well, Gary, mm. tell us what's on the front page of the Business Daily. It's just the headlines, the headlines. Business Daily. Wow. Mm. Hey, deep water. <laughs> Hiya. So, front page of the Business Daily, Thuga Strikes sets tone for the highest loan rate in seven years. So, I think uh, that's uh, a headline that's resonating across the dailies. Mm. Then we have what taxpayers will spend on Huru Raila Kalonzo Perks. Interesting. Mm. Uh, the retired uh, former ruling leaders, what we are paying for their perks. Um, then we go into uh, Kenya increasing domestic, domestic uh, borrowing target by 5 billion shillings. 50. I mean 50 billion shillings, mm. my, my bad. Um, based titanium to take a hit on depleted quarry mining area. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, and how India sugar exports restrictions have hit Kenya. You know, we've been having a lot of problems with sugar, so that should be a very interesting story. Yeah. Uh. Yes. How Kai? How Kai? We look at them in detail, CT. Mm. You have the star. I do have the star yeah. on the top right hand corner in Till Green. Right. Impeachment. Right. Oh, I was going to say, it's impeached today. <laughs> no, 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 impeachment. <laughs> that is the subtitle. <laughs> KK to the rescue. Mm. The senators give CIA Deputy Governor, mm. sorry, not give, save CIA Deputy Governor Oduol. The story is on page two. Uh, okay. Uh-huh. Why are they saying they saved him? Maybe he had a case, and they listened and they said it makes sense. Surely. Hmm? The committee said go home. Mm. Yeah. That's then the other senators said. were like, ah, you know, go where. That's the committee. See, they mm-hmm. went to the plenary and there's a vote. <laughs> uh-huh. What carries the day? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Vote at the plenary. You know, mm-hmm. the excerpts from that particular ruling mm. the, 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 the the committee. I read it. Mm-hmm. It, it didn't make it didn't make sense to me. Mm. No. They say, then they conclude. They say, then they conclude. Mm. What they say in the conclusion, incongruent. Anyway, Ruto's health plan <laughs> to cost 50 billion. That one we've already had, isn't it? Uh, Reforms. New headache as ministry says Kenya only has 250 billion. We, we have half. Okay. Which ministry? Health. We have what? Half the amount. The 250 that billion. Required, we only have half. Mm. Okay. Okay. Mm. By so when should we raise the 500 billion? So that's what we work And with. where are we raising it from? The finance bill is going to help us work this thing. Oh, how about that? Okay, mm-hmm. crazy. All right. Cool. Are you guys visitors to this And country? donors. <laughs> Do- donors are part are of the plan. Are you a visitor to Jerusalem? Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now, new Kemsa boss is dragged into 3.7 billion mess. That's the story on uh, uh, page six. Alcohol crackdown. Nasir orders closure. This is in Mombasa, of course. Closure of bars and near schools. Makes perfect sense. I like it. Perfect sense. And that's just about it in the star. However, in the East Africa, oh, wow. mm-hmm. there's one particular story that I found interesting. UN again accuses Rwanda of aiding M23. So are they gonna? What are they doing about it? 
See, they've said they are they are aiding M23. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What do you mean? <laughs> so they so have said it the before. The story, mm-hmm. They have said it again. Said so it now, again. what do they want? So what do they want? Let me repeat. <laughs> you didn't you didn't get your reference. <laughs> Okay, UN accuses Rwanda of aiding M23. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's the headline. Okay. So the story is about how the UN is complaining that Rwanda, the country, is aiming M23. See, aiding. Eh, yes. They should leave Rwanda alone first of all. <laughs> because <laughs> When they had the opportunity to save Rwanda from this implosion, this that very, happened, this very, this very 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 UN, UN, these people they watched were nowhere. So ah. they should just. So they should never talk. No, not actually, for they, should now, not they should speak. wait a bit. No, no, they should actually not speak. They should just stop. But it's like what is the repercussion when the UN says something? So then they've just said it's okay. When they had an Surely. opportunity to say they can action, they whereby, can go ahead and impose sanctions. We have seen the UN saying things sh- and taking action. Okay, it now the UN said, said now they've said the second time. They want to say for the third okay. time. Yeah, mm. that's that's the thing. That's why we're asking. So what? It, it, mm. it is okay. The problem here is they're saying yeah. that they're giving these guys uniform. They're giving them modern uh, uh, weapon wear, mm. you know, things like that. Mm. And so it means that the problems that M23 are accused of, rape, pillage, mm. instability, etc. Uh, that they're, that they're, 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 they're actually abetting. supporting mm. Yes, and then it requires a new verve, so mm. that because, <clears throat> because of this revamped support. Mm. One could have said the very same thing about them when people were within the boundaries of Rwanda butchering themselves and they did nothing about it. One could have said that in their silence they were actually supporting the same mm. thing going on. Maybe what they're trying to rectify it now. Maybe, yeah. Trying to step because the people, say, of, the people of, of DRC mm. don't need to die because the people of Rwanda died, you know? Yeah, but Rwanda cannot be then, can, it cannot be that, okay, people in DRC continue to die because Rwanda is supporting M23. The it why it can happen. It's not the sole reason. Uh, excuse me. It can happen if they are yes. aiding them. Excuse me. Uh, I'm the one who read this headline. <laughs> you only did the headline, and yes. then after that, you could not tell us anything more. So that we are creating the story for ourselves. I, I we asked you questions here. Yeah, <laughs> you did not. He- no, this is headline <laughs> session, Buana. Uh, okay. Huh? Sawa, so, let's okay, look at traffic. So, so, so. I know how to keep it in the boundaries. <laughs> 28 minutes to 7. Let's look at traffic. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. Yolanda Mulu, DJ Absolute. When the gang is together, got the sugar, got the spice. Yolanda. Yes. I have missed you like a hot hamburger. Yeah? <laughs> like hot hamburger. <laughs> you know, bad boys give Take more money than you can count. Hey, bad boys <laughs> give more money than you can count. If it's fun, it's funky, it's fresh, you're definitely going to catch it here. I don't know what you do every day from 11 a.m. to 3 o'clock, but if I were you, I'd tune in to Sugar and Spice only on 94.4 Spice FM, Nairobi. So if you say it's on, then it's on. Super Highway this morning, it's coming in through towards Garden City and then out towards the Pangani underpass. We'll see that build up as we go through the hours. Um... How about user service lanes this morning? There's an option for you and you don't will not get stuck. Northern bypass traffic is feeding onto Kiambu Road past DCI headquarters. We see that seeping through towards um, Muthaiga Square. It looks all right coming past uh, Kitisuru, Ruaka is not looking bad, but we will definitely see that pile up closer to 7 o'clock. And just like that, it'll happen. James Gishiro going towards Waiaki Way, not too bad now. We're looking at Jogo Road, which is pretty heavy as you're coming out from the Makadara train station on Mombasa Road this morning. Just, you know, if you're, if you're outbound on Mombasa Road, the folks have decided that they're doing some work early this morning. So it's going to slow folks down as you're coming in uh, towards um, General Motors. So just watch out for that. Just pass Airtel. Southfield Mall, as you... Uh, get on to North Airport Road and then out towards Embakasi, towards the Outer Ring Junction. We've got some traffic there. It looks like it will not be too crazy of a Tuesday morning, but let's just keep our wits about, shall we? Let's talk on Spice FM, KE on Twitter and keep things moving this morning. One hundred two point five Spice FM, Kisumu. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94.4. President William Ruto launched the Border Border Care 
all right? A training and empowerment initiative targeting operators of motorcycle taxis. I like that. <laughs> motorcycle taxis. Mm -hmm. Under the program, the government will pay for one year's insurance cover for 117,000 border operators who have received road safety and first aid training. So you go through the training, you learn how to behave yourself on the road, then government will pay insurance for you for a year. All right? Wait. Just because you've gone for training... We, the taxpayers, are going to take up insurance for you. Yeah, because now you know how mm. to behave properly on the road and you will not just be doing mago mago anyhow when you're driving from here to there. So now that we know we are the ones who have trained you, we know you behave yourself, so then we pay for you. Transport. How do you exactly exactly wonder if that works. Because, I mean, when you go for training, you train, you know, and you learn all the things. But when you come back on the roads, you, you just, yeah, it's a jungle, man. Abi? So now they're saying, mm -hmm. uh, now if you have received road safety, first aid training, you are licensed and a member of a savings and credit cooperative called a SACO, then 117,000 of them will get this one year's insurance. After that, you're on your own. Uh, the program, which who's, is... Who's, who's issuing the insurance? Watch out, Wendele. Boda Boda Care. Okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. The program, which is being run by the Transport and Health Ministries alongside the National Health Insurance Fund, NHIF, um, and St. John's Ambulance is aimed at providing insurance and equipping the riders with life-saving skills to ensure that they comply with NTSA regulations. So there was a launch at the KICC yesterday. President Ruto said the program aims to enlist more riders to NHIF. So you see what happens now? You're broadening the grid, NHIF, more people getting <coughs> under there. Mm. And to ensure that they're able to handle medical emergencies in case of accidents and stop this business of Harambe's. We will identify 117,000. I don't know why 117,000. I guess it goes to the figure. Mm -hmm. um, and pay NHIF for them and the families for the next one year. Thereafter, they'll do it for themselves. However, they must have already been trained, have a license, have received emergency training by St. John's and be a member of a SACO. That's what he said. You do all those things, we pay for you one year. It's an incentive to keep you. You will see that. To make sure that they now go for training. Exactly. Actually, you must have done the training, then you can come and we can then select you. Mm. But what they're hoping to do from this is that they'll get more people <coughs> on NHIF and then you will see the benefit yeah. of having the insurance and then come year two, mm -hmm. you will then pay for yourself because you've been through 365 mm -hmm. days of having this cover. Universal health care mm. is the goal. Uh -huh. Okay, Health coverage, I beg your pardon. Universal health coverage is the goal. And then you have more people who are operating on the roads, who are covered by insurance. Anything happens to them, their families are not left for, for want. And, you know, all these wonderful things are happening. So this is health insurance, or is it no, also it. accident insurance? It's health insurance. It says co NHIF cover and training on first aid in case of road accident. Yeah. So it's just an HIF cover. Yeah. yeah, it's not for like their uh, comprehensive motor vehicle insurance or anything like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think it's a good move. I mean, I, I, you know, we always sometimes talk about the the horrible things <coughs> and the horrible policies of government. I think this is this is a fantastic thing for them to do. Right. Um, I just uh, uh, wonder with the current cost, uh, state of affairs. You know, once you give them a, fee, a year free mm. insurance next year, are they really going to? Are they going to do it for themselves? Yeah, they the hope is that they will see the benefit, but are they going yeah, to? Yeah, I wonder. I mm. wonder. I hope so, but I. I I don't feel like that. So what, what NHIF is what? Per month is what? I think what they could have done is say that uh, we can we can lower the cost of training. All right? So the subsidy goes in the training. Sure. Because there's also that whole talk of talking about they are going to look at how they can bring down the cost of training and licensing from 10500 to 2500 So if, if we, the taxpayers, were subsidizing training for border border guys and then after that they go and take up their own insurance or one of the conditions for actually qualifying for this is you have paid have 500 sure. bob for nhif i'd see it sure because but what saying that saying? i am paying for an uh, border but border guy because yeah is because there a high demand for training? training training it's a requirement it's a regulation so essentially what's going to happen here is because it's 500 bob a pop right mm. 500 bob uh in a so you're paying <clears> essentially it's six thousand shillings a year One hundred seventeen thousand of them is about 700 million shillings that will mm -hmm. be spent by government in mm -hmm. the year and i guess that's the question also where's this money coming from number one number two uh, is it available and then would you then get the benefits that we we're seeking after doing this what would the benefit be here mm. to give people the appetite for it to mm. to pay for insurance yeah. and or to see the benefit of having an insurance cover because you see already the training is expensive as per the Buddha Buddha people 10,700 or 10,500 they say it's expensive the president is promising to talk to NH to NYS and to talk to members of parliament to see how they can bring this down to below 5,000 mm. okay that should be the incentive 
Yeah, but then the problem is get the incentive is, 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 on that is, is, is and then say correctly because it's, is it is it that the people they don't want to get the insurance or is it that they can't afford to get the insurance? Right? So even want. if you incentivize them to. and give them for one year, this doesn't mean next year they're going to get the insurance because it's an affordability issue, right? Which insurance? The health insurance? Yeah. NHF. See, they go and sign up for health insurance if they want. Why am I paying a health insurance for a Boda Boda rider? It's a question I'm asking. Mm. Why? Mm. I can see the sense of paying for their training, mm. for them to regularize, to follow the regulations of NTSA. But why am I paying health insurance for a Boda Boda rider who's earning a daily living? And who's a member of a circle? Yeah. Why don't they work through that circle? They work through that circle. Sure these things actually work. Because I'm saying there are other, members. there can be other ways to incentivize them mm. to actually get on the. On yeah. The thing. Other than taking money, this is a government that had delayed remitting money that it ought to have been remitting to NHIF until the other day. Hospitals were not receiving money because NHIF was cash strapped. Mm. Why? Because government government has not sent money to NHIF for. Uh, Linda Mama, that's the free maternity. Government has not been sending money for all the workers mm -hmm. in government that it has been deducting and not sending that money to NHIF. Now the government is promising to send, how many millions did you calculate it to? 702 million. To NHIF. Those are lies. Mm. I mean, so what's the end game? The end game really is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> These are stories. <laughs> this is a, uh, maybe it's politics, maybe bringing in the border borders into the fold. Eh? Yeah. They are a huge voting block. Please mm. remember. The yeah, it's like they're, they're although, hearing although this, they're the getting something for free. Although the president pointedly said, mm. the, he pointedly said, you know, this is not about politics. This is, you know, I'm trying to support the border border guys. Of course. Course. At the end of the day. That when you are told by a politician that what they're saying is not political, then it's a thousand, <laughs> it's nothing, nothing could be, it's could be everything more, but. <laughs> nothing could be more political than that. You look at the initiative uh, and you look at the thinking that we are presented with, uh, as Eric says, it makes sense. Mm. These people, these citizens already have found the need to get into their own circles, into their own associations, based on the areas they operate in. Mm -hmm. They're already an organized group. Yeah. The payment of this insurance, they can pay. Mm. They do not need the government yeah. to get them They're in pay. business, they are earning, they're in a circle. Yes, mm -hmm. they work they every should single be day. Able to so the pay. question is, pay. What, what is the end game? Mm. It's just giving it freebies. Clearly not, yeah. It is government freebies being dished out. Further down in that story, the president now talks about the e-mobility, the electric border borders that are coming. Mm. From mm. September 1st, 2023, we will have received 10,000 electric motorbikes and by December, we'll have 100,000 motorbikes. From then on, listen to this, riders will be allowed to hand over their petrol bikes to the government for replacement with an electric one. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? free electric bikes uh, because the government is not going to take that that old bike mm. and give it out to anybody else mm. our whole idea is to remove the mm. petrol bikes mm -hmm. from the roads so when the government takes up this petrol bike where is it taking it from and when the government is giving out the free electric bike to the Buddha Buddha in exchange, who has bought it? And when they say they will receive these bikes, 10,000 and 100,000, mm. receive meaning what exactly? In the country. Mm. Yes, they will be in the country. Been imported, yes. Okay, so who will have bought them? Yes. And who will be selling them? Mm. It is the government. And you know, 100,000 in the population of Boda Boda, Boda Boda, that's just a drop in the ocean. It so, is. you know, you give 100,000, maybe people, uh, appetites are wetted, demand increases. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then now the, the market is, comes in. You know, yeah. in the Moyera, there was a company called Kumsons. Mm. They imported certain vehicles for security forces for the police. Mm. Maximum speed, you could run faster than that car. Yeah. <laughs> okay, mm. you always bad mouth those vehicles. I'm not bad mouthing <laughs> those vehicles. I <laughs> surely those things. Did you ever run faster than that car? No, but I watched okay. it. I mean, from <laughs> gear one to four, you ca it's still there. And the Mahindra. The guy has changed gear four times. And it's just here. Hundred me <laughs> it's a hundred meters away. So how fast do you think that thing is moving? <laughs> what, what I'm trying to say is, mm. the thinking and the idea is plausible and it even makes sense what doesn't make sense why are you giving people who are in business freebies when they can afford if the government said they are they are pre pre uh, presenting a scheme to their circles through which they can affordably pay for these things mm. i understand mm. makes sense mm. but these guys have money they make money mm. 
let them pay for these things or are they being told it's free and then someone along the line they'll be told actually you know something is not actually free uh, you need to pay this and this and the mm -hmm. other they can pay when you tell me you're looking at people who are unwell people who are living with disabilities being given a freebie oh that makes perfect sense mm -hmm. there, there, there's, there's even no discussion yeah but on this one mm. no so they're getting free electric bikes a hundred thousand of them as basically what we are saying is the government is going to import one hundred thousand motorbikes and dish them out for free yes to buddha buddha riders and then we are going to get 117,000 Buddha Buddha riders mm -hmm. and give them 5,000, uh, 6,000 bob each mm -hmm. ka, 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 by paying for the NHIF. Mm -hmm. Eric, what makes you think they're going to remain 117,000, 147? It could even change. It's going to change because if that is what is on offer, can you see the number of people who will join these circles and be Buddha Buddha riders increasing? That they should increase is good. But that they must pay their way like everybody else is even better. They must pay. These are youth. The demographic that we're talking about is youthful, productive people. Absolutely. Energetic people. They Aye. can. I think it's political currency. Yeah, but there's too much freebie being given. I, now mean, with I, that. Mean, I, would have, I think it's good to, to focus on this on this uh, this industry and border border. Of course, you need a lot of support, but mm. I think you need some sustainable programs. I think this is not really something that you can say to two three years from now we'll see some strong you know benefits yeah right so yeah. I, I wish there had been a little bit more thinking about how to support them more sustainably well Gary, you're going to tell us about that uh, what kamau thuge has done but before you do that as you now line up your thoughts let me tell you masharia gaido has the tuesday column mm -hmm. today <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, is, a, is, is a different one here where he talks about ah it's not the one that actually went out Ah, they changed look, it. Look, 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 Eric. Look, oh. and there you found it. They mm -hmm. changed it. To? Uh, say the one you thought it was. Uh, yes, say the one you thought it was, Eric, uh, so that we can hear. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing it, man. <coughs> okay, no, this is the one for last week. Was it last week then? Ah. Anyway, so let me read the one I had seen. Oh, it's online. Kenya Kwanza geniuses will lead Kenya to prosperity. June 27th. It's actually what's online, mm -hmm. but what they have uh, put here... It's different. It's different. Tread with care on revolution calls. It okay. is all right. So let me read the one that's online. It is official, Masharia Gaido says. The highly contentious housing fund slash tax slash levy slash collection slash contribution slash donation slash charity slash gift slash whatchamacallit is not about filling a critical gap in affordable housing. It's about creating jobs. This was brought clearly home by National Assembly Majority Leader Kemani Ishongwa, speaking in support of the finance bill last week. Ishongwa told a captive house that provision of housing was only secondary to the millions of construction jobs created that will pull unemployed, unemployed youth off the streets and come into productive pursuits. There will also be cement, doors, steel, window frames, concrete blocks, nails and other local inputs whose production will grow in leaps and bounds and catapult Kenya into an industrialized nation and ultimately into a major economic power. That was the gist of the government pitch in Parliament, meaning we can forget Kenya breweries, Bitco, Chandaria, BAT, Keroche, Coca-Cola, and other major industrial concerns. Step aside, Safaricom, Airtel, Zuku, Jami, and others in the infotech sector. Take a walk, Equity Bank, KCB, Cooperative Bank, NCBA, APSA, Stanchat, and the rest of the banking giants. Move over tea, coffee, avocado, cut flowers, horticulture, milk, beef, and other agricultural sector historicals, and you can remain in slumber, tourism, and the entire hospitality industry our kenya kwanza geniuses have found the solution a sure and guaranteed way to rapid wealth and prosperity that has eluded all other countries in the world not even the u.s japan china switzerland india germany france britain russia and other industrial and economic behemoths grew out of such a simple and a brilliant solution Neither did Singapore, Malaysia, South Korea, Hong Kong, and Malaysia hit on, on such ingenuity in pulling themselves out of the third world into an enviable prosperity. Also, we don't need the oil of the Middle East or the golden diamonds of South, Af South Africa. Kenya will not only be the first nation on earth to make this giant leap from poverty to superpower merely by building houses that are needed, but will bequeath the world a revolutionary new development model and economic ideology that will render both capitalism and socialism redundant.
Masharia Gaido is wow. on a roll on that one. <laughs> Says it's absolute genius. It's not about, you know, even building houses. It's about creating jobs. This housing levy is a job creation same tool. Ma same Masharia Gaido, <laughs> who early on in the year said he does not understand why it is mm. Azimio are bothering with these mandamanos. Mm. Why don't they just sit back and watch the KK government dismantle itself? <laughs> and then sit on the wayside and just say, oh, okay, you're done. Here we are. Yeah. The story of the central bank. Yes, Swagari. Tell us now. The headline mm. in the business daily is... Duga strikes its tone for the highest loan rate in seven years. So essentially, the uh, central bank rate has gone up from 9.5% to 10.5%. Essentially, what does that mean? Mm. Uh, the central bank rate is the rate at which banks borrow from the central bank, right? Because the central bank is the, is, the, is the lender for banks. Okay. So if banks are borrowing from the central bank at 10.5%, when they lend to consumers and companies and corporates, of course, the rate is also going to go up. up. So what's going to happen? loans, access to credit, uh, money in the market, it's actually going to go, it's going to be more expensive, right? So if you have a, if you have a loan in place, um, you, you know, if you are fortunate to have it at a variable rate, if you are getting into new loans, you're going to pay much more money to access. But at the same time, you know, I have to say, one of the things I'm seeing across government is that they seem to be speaking with one voice. Eh? So, you know, with the finance bill, mm. the, the budget, then now what's happening in Central Bank, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a harmony mm. happening. You know, it's like a, a really good choir, right? So if by saying, you know, we need to uh, collect more money uh, from uh, domestic uh, borrowing, this is what is happening because people are going to want to put their money in central bank uh, uh, securities because they're earning a lot more, a lot more money. Mm. But the effect on uh, on us, on the economy, is going to be um, it's it's going to be it's tough because now we're going more into a recessionary um, situation because if you increase. Uh, essentially, this tool is to control inf inflation. Okay. Again, what inflation is? Of course, I know uh, uh, the the listeners know inflation is when the the cost of uh, the cost of a basket of goods, for example, goes higher over, over a period of time. Mm. So, if you are paying ten shillings in year one uh, for a, a, a bag of chips, maybe if, if there is inflation by ten percent, you're going to uh, you, it's going to be higher. What did I say? If you're paying hundred shillings, it's going to be hundred and ten. For example, mm. it goes higher, right? So, if you increase interest rates, uh, the demand for goods and services goes down, consumption, because um, you don't have enough money. In fact, you're, you're putting your money in securities, you're not spending much uh, in, the, in the supermarkets and on daily needs. Yeah? So that means um, consumption goes down, which makes inflation go down, because now demand is low. This is all kind is of com a, a little bit economic <laughs> talking. I don't know. No, that's you're, that's following. that's and that's you know the reason why we are blessed to have you here. So, and mm. then this story comes out on a day like today, so mm. you can explain to us. Mm. So when you say that you raise the interest rate, you are stemming inflation. Mm -hmm. You're saying that I still have my hundred bob because my income has not varied, right? If it I slows it down. So if, in, so if, if I still had a hundred shillings, percent, now it goes down. It goes. How does it go band. down? Because uh, inflation happens when there's a, uh, there's a lot of money in the economy, a lot of uh, um, there's more money, money supply. And less goods. Then, then uh, money they call the velocity of money. Money mm. moves into the in the economy much faster. Okay. So that means the prices of, of goods goes higher because people have a lot of money and they can bid the the price of goods up. But if there's not that much money, it stems it down. So people don't have as much money, so there's not as much demand for goods. So then the prices start to go down and they start to start to be tempered. And the money stops circulating fast because I have now opted to save it. It's starting it. to mop up. Yeah, the government is essentially mopping up the money in the in the economy. So uh, less money, less demand. Inflation. Goods become there. cheaper. Yeah. For the rest of us. Yeah. Right. Do you get it? No. Mm. I, 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 I get the theory. Mm. I get the theory, but there has to be certain constants. Because for that to work, it is assumed that certain things will be constant. Mm -hmm. The theory that if you raise the bank rate, banks will 
be charged more by the central bank and in turn they will charge more and also offer more if mm -hmm. you uh, keep money with them that you will mop up money. Mm -hmm. You can't mop up something that doesn't exist. Okay. Right now, people are dredging the bottom of every possible barrel that they can come across. So the idea of there being money to save, there'll be a small clique of individuals who can save that money. The vast majority are going to have a problem because the theory, this country defies economic theory. You are assuming <laughs> that, yes, you are assuming that if there isn't enough money in circulation, the demand will automatically bring the prices down. In this country, it will go up. Wait and see. So, City, do you think there's a lot of money in circulation at present? There's, That's hardly, driving... there's hardly any money. So why is there inflation? There is inflation mm. because, one, we don't have enough goods to meet the needs of the people who need it. And mm -hmm. the goods we have are expensive. Why? Because if it's local, the cost of production is through the roof. And right now, the government is guaranteeing that, that the cost of production, however you look at it, is going to continue rising. So the cost of these very things that we're talking about will not go down. It will increase. Even if you reduce the circulation of money, in fact, we'll be able to afford even less than what we're able to afford. So this inflation that they hope to bring down will actually go up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, is that how this, economics this, works? This, this, is, this is why we call economics an art, uh -huh. right? <laughs> this is not an exact science. Yeah. Um, typically, when you increase the interest rates, the inflation goes down. The, I think we've seen that the world over. This has I think been that's, proven a, that's a monetary time and policy time again. Yeah, that's a monetary policy tool that has proven to to work. Has it worked before in Kenya? It has worked before in Kenya. It has okay. worked before in different jurisdictions. The point you raise about uh, the economy suffering more, I think, is is a valid one. Um, so I think uh, the that already with people having limited amounts of money because as we said you know the in, the wages haven't increased right salary ha salaries haven't increased so if businesses are starting to feel the pinch of uh, no access to credit um, uh, they have a propensity to want to uh, put their money into securities because that's where they'll earn more money it's a safe bet mm. uh, then that means uh, you know employment might go up uh, and they will be the cost of living actually may be exacerbated, but for the inflation uh, inflationary purposes and for the purposes of government, you see the government is very clear. They want to get money to pay debt to close the fiscal deficit, and this is exactly the tune that they are playing to. The piper, the president, <laughs> has played the tune, <laughs> and people are following that mm. tune. And I'm saying that he is going to achieve the complete opposite of what he purposes to achieve. And actually, this is a, a link to a conversation we had the last time. Eh? Yes. Mm. I was saying, in terms of if what we're looking in the budget, if there's going to be these very difficult, uh, uh, tough measures, austere measures put in, we also need on to see on the other side what the safety net measures are. This is one of the, the problems I have with the issue around NHIF, mm. because NHIF, it tends to be a, a safety measure. If, you have if everybody has NHIF, if something happens and you have no money, then you have a safety net. Have but now we see what's happening with NHIF. There are scandals galore, uh, payments are not being paid to hospitals and the prices are going up oh. so everything is kind of it's it's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle or a rubik's cube yeah it, it, it you have to make sure that you're you're putting it in a way that all your your policies align mm -hmm. and sometimes they align, well, they align this well. is more like a ponzi scheme if, if, if <laughs> <laughs> a ponzi scheme <laughs> how so <laughs> well you see the thing is you borrow to pay to pay so that you can borrow to pay and you ensure and say that this is what's happening and people get paid but you keep borrowing. But the reason why your borrowing is never sorted out, the reason why you have this debt that never seems to go away irrespective of how much you pay is never sorted out. Mm -hmm. So at some point this thing is going to crumble. It doesn't matter what you do. And also the issue of, of bor uh, borrowing from Peter to pay Paul also has to do with the... With the, the if you're borrowing for infrastructure, for example, which yeah. you know primarily should be, infrastructure is supposed to generate income, but it doesn't generate income immediately. Mm. So you're giving yourself that grace period if it's 20 years. You say, okay, in 20 years, we're going to uh, now be able to generate income from this infrastructure. But uh, in the meantime, you have you get into that situation of uh, borrowing from Peter to pay Paul, which mm. is not uh, ideal. Uh, and also, it's not guaranteed in 20 years you're going to be getting a return on that infrastructure. That infrastructure. So it really is a game that you have to play. Oof. Anyway, later on, hopefully game. you shall get some time. You'll also explain to 
was when the government says it's going to buy back some of that euro bond mm. that's due next year what does that mean and how will that help anyway keep it here wangari moikia is our guest host today she's an economist she is a lead consultant at egcl what's it egcl what? institute institute good morning 7 a.m Spice up your life. Good morning. This is the news wire. I'm Lea Obaga. Parents and guardians have been advised to set aside time to guide their children during their midterm break. According to the new timetable released by the Ministry of Education, the break officially starts today and ends on Sunday, despite some schools already releasing students last week. Bungoma Director of Education, Pius Ngoma, says they've noticed with concern how most parents don't follow up on the whereabouts and concerns of their children. Now they'll be coming for half term. Check where is your daughter. Why any wasial was that is easy? Wasiana Munaweka Kama Mayai. A lava Yana Maza Munaja Munawanda Uko kwa drugs and drug abuse. The other performance, we're getting that now get your performance. Wasiana on a final view present of Vulan. Nadiago will be the biggest aid. Nadiago will child labor. Sigiana, as you care for our daughters, let us also care for our boys. His father urged parents to limit the use of mobile phones, saying that it exposes their children to negative content, especially on social media. Very clear with everything done. You talk about geography, history, everything. As the Senate debated a report on the impeachment of CIA Deputy Governor William O'Dole, senators took the opportunity to condemn the previous impeachments of county bosses, terming them political witch hunt. The senators, led by Nandi counterpart, that is Nandi Senator Samson Cherergue, condemned the previous impeachment cases of former Nairobi Governor Mike Sonko and former Kiambu Governor Ferdinand Waititi to terming them political schemes that were aimed at bringing down popular leaders using fabricated allegations against them. Cherergue said the Senate should never be used to settle political battles between governors and their critics. So speaker, an impeachment procedure is a political procedure and a political process. When you look at my Mbufi case in the Supreme Court, it should follow certain procedures. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the Senate does not serve as a ground of sanitizing or processing political disputes, political egos or machismo, Mr. Speaker, sir. Mr. Speaker, sir, we should be treating the Deputy Governor William O'Dwell as a whistleblower, Mr. Speaker, sir. He is being sacrificed at the expense of others, Mr. Speaker, sir. Azimir leader Raila Odinga is expected to, ra to arrive in the country from Poland today in order to lead the People's Baraza that's set to take place at Kamkunji Ground. Azimir leaders have urged police to provide them with security. They say that they, are, that they will receive Raila at JKIA accompanied by their supporters and thereafter march peacefully towards Kamkunji Grounds for their meeting. The meeting is aimed at discussing strategies that will be used to oppose the already signed into law 2023 finance bill. The Kenya police, we are partners still in managing the security situation of our country. We ask you to provide for us security from JKIA to Kamukunji grounds peacefully because we are peace-loving Kenyans. The seven comes as the High Court has, for the second time, declined to derail the Finance Bill 2023, which was signed into law yesterday morning by President William Ruto at State House Nairobi. Justice Mugure Thande failed to issue orders halting implementation of the law, as requested by five petitioners, led by Busia Senator Okia Omtata and three others, pending hearing of a case that alleges the bill was unconstitutional.
And in the international, since South Africa has reported two outbreaks of highly pathogenic H7 bird flu in poultry east of Johannesburg. The Paris-based World Organization for Animal Health says 9,500 farm poultry died from the virus in the town of Victor Kanye in Mupamalanga province. The strain detected was H7, which is different from the H5N1, one that has killed several hundred million birds around the world. That's the Newswire. I'm Lea Ubaga. Spice FM, Nakuru. And there it is. After 7 o'clock this morning is when you see most of the traffic starting to build up on the thicker superhighway coming in hot and heavy towards the CBD. And we're seeing the same thing on Kambu Road today, now well before the DCI headquarters. On James Gishuru, it's spilling over towards Waiakiwe. And we have some traffic also coming off of uh, Naivasha Road, leading towards Gitanga Road. It's heavy coming off that side of Gong Road. <clears throat> and then getting out towards the city. The southern bypass is looking pretty good as a way to you get towards Langata Road and then out towards the city. Let's look at Magadi Road, which is piling up as you come towards that Bomas Junction. So we'll see some traffic then on Langata Road as you're trying to get into the city. Let's look on the other side of things where Jogo Road also piled up early. Still continuing as you go out towards the city stadium roundabout. There's some traffic that comes towards Lusaka and the rest of it goes towards Landis. So where are you this morning? Are you stuck on Outer Ring? Because quite a number of folks are it's going to snake along slowly if you're going towards the thicker road direction or if you're coming out towards mombasa road in and outbound traffic is doing the thing as it is on north airport road going towards the eastern bypass and then towards outer ring traffic hour is officially here even before 7 30 let's keep an eye on things and see how it opens up talk to us on spice fmke on twitter This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is the uh, Situation seven minutes Room, after seven. the Good only morning. way Welcome to start to your day. Welcome the Situation Room. This is Kenya's biggest conversation. We are live on Spice FM. We are also broadcasting on KTN Home, as well as broadcasting on YouTube and Facebook, where we live stream every morning. And also, you'll find our conversations there. If you miss any conversation at any point, you can actually catch up with our conversations later by going to YouTube and you'll find recordings of this show. Colgate is reminding you of the plight of very many people across the country who need, just like you and I, clean drinking water, but they don't have access to clean drinking water. So what Colgate has done is they've gone around the country and they've identified some uh, families and areas and communities and they want to start benefiting 150,000 Kenyans by building 30 water wells that will provide clean water to them. What you need to do to support them in this particular cause is just a little water making a big difference for every pack of Colgate that you buy exclusively at Naivas supermarket. You will help build these 30 water wells. So what you need to do is is give a helping hand, shop at your nearest Naivas or online at naivas.co.ke. And for more information about this campaign, you can go to Colgate Palmolive Facebook page or www.colgate.ke. That's www.colgate.ke. Help Colgate do the thing that uh, we'd like them to do. And that is giving access to many people who have no access to water. Our next guest is here to talk to us about supporting and financing MSMEs in Kenya. Harrison Gatia is the head of SME development at the Kenya Private Sector Alliance. Good morning, Harrison. 
Good morning, Eric. Welcome to Kenya's biggest conversation. Welcome to the hot seat of the situation room. Thank you, thank you, and uh, good morning, uh, uh, my uh, listeners. Mm-hmm. And, and the viewers. Yes, viewers. <laughs> and viewers, yes, yes. I wanted to say viewers. So yeah, but then you're, going, to, you're yeah. wondering, okay, is, yes. it, is it right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Karibu sana. Asante sana. Um, welcome to Kenya's Biggest Conversation. Today you're lucky we have a guest host. So there's somebody else who is here with us. Wangari Moikia is our guest host. She's an economist. She's a lead consultant at EGCL. Institute. Institute. <laughs> I was about to say capital. <laughs> EGCL capital. Or EGCL and partners. Uh. To welcome you to the show, uh, Harrison, CT has the day's proverb. Yes, our proverbs for the whole of this week, ending on Friday, are from the country of Chad. Mm-hmm. Chad is somewhere in the middle of Africa. Mm. Huge country. The proverb. We'll be asking what you think. There is no such thing as a small fire or a small woman. There is no such thing as a small fire or a small woman. Mm. Harrison, what do you make of that? Problem? What's, your, inter- celebrate what's, what's, your, what's your interpretation <laughs> of this? Um, what I will interpret is um, uh, in terms of fire. Um, if it catches anywhere, any, anyone or any place, it may extend to as far as it can go. Right. In terms of the women, I think um, being that they are the, uh, the pillars of the society, uh, they contribute and they ensure and uh, ensure um, from the smallest in the family, mm. the child, to the highest in the level of family, mm. they are able to take care of everyone. Well done. Mm. <laughs> you know, you've navigated <laughs> that one very well. Actually, this man, <laughs> I suspect his wife is listening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've navigated that one very well. To skill the same Speaking from experience. <laughs> <laughs> He's experienced mm. <laughs> from siblings to from mother to siblings mm. to spouse. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean to yeah. fires. Mm, to fires. Mm. <laughs> 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 all right, Harrison. First of all, you know, every time we talk about micro, small, and medium enterprises, there's always this whole confusion about the interpretation of MSMEs. Mm-hmm. What are MSMEs in the Kenyan context? Is it Something that we know, we say there's a clear definition by the government of Kenya on this is what qualifies to be a micro, a small, a medium enterprise, or is it just something that we say, okay, so as long as this Biashara is like this, it's an MSME. Okay, there is a clear definition uh, which is um, in the MSME Act, the Micro and Small uh, Enterprise Act. So micro, we look at uh, any businesses that has less than uh, 10 employees. Mm -hmm. And in terms of turnover, though it's a bit outdated because it was was defined in 2012, it's up to 500,000 Kenya shillings. Mm -hmm. When you go to smaller enterprises, uh, uh, between uh, 10 employees to 50, uh, then 50. 50 employees. Okay. That's small. That is that's small. small. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's small. Uh, then uh, turnover. Uh, in terms of turnover, between five hundred to five million. Okay. Uh, then for now, for the medium enterprise, any enterprise between uh, uh, turnover of between five million, uh, which is big to, to around eight hundred million. Then in terms of uh, employees, uh, between fifty to two fifty to two hundred and fifty. Yes. Mm-hmm. So anything that is has an annual turnover, any business that has annual turnover of over 800 is classified as large. As a large enterprise. Okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, what if this two don't match? What if, let's say, you, are, you have less than 10 people in your organization, but you're raking in more than 500,000 in annual turnover? Um, so uh, in terms of uh, the operation uh, operationalization different 
entities or if it's financial institutions look at it from a different angle. So it has not been well defined because you will always find that uh, if it's uh, financial institution one, financial institutions define it in a different angle. So they will say we are targeting SMEs between this turnover to this turnover. Okay. So um, uh, making it very difficult now when uh, organization, especially in the SMEs, when they, they want to access funding. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So because of that confusion, uh, it has not been accepted uh, uh, based on uh, different needs and uh, different uh, niche markets that uh, the different financial institutions have. Okay, so then you're saying that both of those parameters then must be used for the definition uh, in terms of numbers of employees in addition to turnover because it's possible for you to have one person, one person mm -hmm or two people in an organization mm -hmm. who's turned over and they, they're regarded as micro, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, in terms of that size. Mm -hmm. But their turnover could be much more than somebody who is in a large, for example, mm -hmm. by nature, by the nature of what they do. Isn't it? Yes. It's possible, it's, it's, that, it's, it's, it's that, possible. that a micro, in terms of turnover, could be much higher than one who is higher up strata in terms of size. Yes. That's so we are saying that you have to have uh, a combination, a combination of, of the two mm -hmm. to define yes. the kind of enterprise. Yes, yes. But they also look at, um, the, there is also the issue of uh, assets. Mm. Um, um, the, how much does your company mm. have in terms of assets? So there are different uh, metrics that are used for uh, measuring mm -hmm. the, the, the size of the businesses. Okay. So it depends with the circumstances and uh, the the requirements and the needs of 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 of, of who wants to to use the the metrics okay. what what qualifies as being an asset um asset we usually see yeah, this entity which when you look at i know okay asset is an asset okay they look at this one is a pen asset. an asset uh -huh. a desk an asset yes a vehicle this the machinery flask of mine asset so they are different they, they are we have current artists mm. and and uh, uh long-term artists yeah. mm. current assets is like uh, liquid cash mm. liquid cash is current assets mm. if you look at uh, uh, um, uh, uncorrected debts from customers mm. those are assets Mm -hmm. uh, but now they are long term assets. They, they want tangible assets that are known. Could you just mm. pause for a yes, second? Yes. So it means if I've done business with the county government yes. and they owe me X amount of shillings, mm -hmm. that's an asset. That's an asset. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And this asset is of benefit to me when I am seeking a loan. Yes, uh, though it will be evaluated in a way whether you can liquidate that asset so that it can determine whether you can be able to use it to for repayment. So it's uh, essentially fluid. Okay. It depends. Yes. Uh, what I'm saying, a debt can be used. There are those uh, debts that are usually they will turn over mm -hmm. very fast. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, the normal debt. The, probably you have a debt that you uh, with your customers that you will pay within that I mean, that uh, days. That days. Yes. That's a good asset mm -hmm. that will be used to access your financial mm. uh, capability to repay loan. Mm. Okay. So yeah. essentially you're saying that the person who owes me money yes. is one who's actually being assessed because. <laughs> In terms of mm. whether I can turn over this debt, yes. the debt exists, mm -hmm. but someone has to pay but it. But who to me. owes it? Yes, who owes it now plays into this. Essentially, if you have a pending bill of 100 million from the government mm. and you're going and you're saying that's an asset, mm. someone knows very well that you may not be able to <laughs> settle that 100, <laughs> yes. that 100 million. So it's an asset, but yes, it's a yes. dead asset. Yeah, in yeah. Yeah. And that's why it's important, even for uh, micro and small enterprises. Mm. You know, the way the banks and the big, uh, the large corporates, mm. the way they assess uh, you to, to get credit. Mm. That's the way even a small enterprise should assess mm. Mm. You know, before they give out someone. You know, mm. yeah. yes, yes. I used to be a telephone farmer. Mm -hmm. telephone, telephone farmer. Phone. Telephone yes, farmer. meaning the farming was taking place elsewhere. Oh. <laughs> I, I was only farming telephones. <laughs> because, you know, I wasn't growing telephones because if you grow telephones, you need to clarify that. Yes, thank you. You're a Kenyan man. Yeah. We can't just rule it out. <laughs> thank you so much. I used to practice my farming through the phone. Thank mm. you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yes. 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 And at any given point, I had something like 30 to 40 people working. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
but on and off depending on whether I needed them to do various duties that one does in the farm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to assess, I have this number of people working for me. They don't work for me every day, mm -hmm. but in the course of the year, they may work for me a total of, say, three months. Mm -hmm. Because staggered, but three months. Mm -hmm. I have a piece of land. Mm -hmm. If these assets were being assessed, first of all, would I fall in that category of a small business because of these people who work for me intermittently? Mm. And what then would you be looking at? Because let's say I am farming sugarcane and the earliest I am likely to get my money is in 18 months. Okay, from the time I plant and do all these things. When I finish everything, I sit back and wait before I am paid. In such a situation, how exactly, well one, what category would I fall into? Because that category will then determine what it is I can pursue in terms of the benefit of, say, a loan or financial assistance. Uh, in terms of uh, the number of uh, employees, we look at the average numbers. Mm. Uh, so in casual and, and, yeah? and the casuals and the permanent. Yes. Mm -hmm. What is your average? You know, you can be engaging uh, 30 to 40 uh, mm. in uh, three months, mm. but only probably at, at any particular time only 10 to 15 mm. yes mm. so that's 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 your average number mm. in terms of employees mm. uh, and in terms of uh, then your uh, turnover you look at it uh, at the end of 18 months so it means 18 months you get your your payment mm. so uh, and one of the uh, the challenges that especially farmers who who do long term mm -hmm. farming have is uh, getting financing that takes care of the uh, the 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 period mm -hmm. which you may take so unless mostly they get um, uh, they will get they will get funding but there are so many financial decisions who, who do not understand that but also they also want to ensure that they are also liquidating their cash flow okay. so there is a challenge f to ensure that farmers needs are met uh, through funding mm. because of the the period mm. that the products will take before they uh, they mature and mm. get their payment. So I should stop farming. But we have different financing. Yes, mm. they, they not necessarily the the commercial financing. Most of them may have challenges, but mm. they are different funding. So they are products. Yeah, they are different products That's that have actually been yeah. designed for. Farmers. For farmers, yes. For different categories yes, of farmers. You, yeah, you cannot just go to a bank and, and mm. get that unless a bank has an agriculture product mm. that takes care of mm. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a follow up question. I mean, today, uh, as we understand it, is that world, is it SME or MSME day? MSME. MSME Day. Yes. Um, and it should be interesting to, to understand what that particularly means for, for us. But then, as I was reading yesterday, uh, I, f I was reading that 98% of all businesses in Kenya are MS in the category of MSMEs, which blew my mind. Yes. This is actually quite, you're actually dealing with everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it would be interesting to understand. Um, you know, what are, how do you, because in my mind, I always used to think about MSMEs. When I think about MSMEs, I think of the Mamambogas, I think of the informal businesses. But actually, the minute I walk out of these studios, everybody is, is, uh, is an MSME, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So how, in the context of SME Day, uh, and in the context of some of the challenges that have been outlined, you know, they say, you know, MSMEs is lack of access to credit, a lot, lack of access to markets. If everybody, 98% of businesses, uh, undergoing those challenges mm -hmm. uh, how how are you uh, even through the the celebrations of today addressing these for what it seems to be everybody is the challenge that everybody is facing uh, and what progress have we made because this story has been there for a long time eh? a access to great credit logistics management um, market access has been there from time immemorial since we identified this as a category are we still saying that those are the challenges Paka today or have we made strides and we are moving forward from a particular point of progress? Okay, uh, I'll start uh, with uh, why we need to celebrate the, the MSME mm -hmm. and today. Uh, if you look at the way we have said, 90% of the uh, uh, 
the business in Kenya mm. are MSMEs. Uh, just to bring that to perspective, uh, if you look at 800 million, how many businesses have turnover of more than 800 million in Kenya? <laughs> Hmm. Yes. Yeah. Very few. Yeah. Yeah. Very few. Yeah, very few. Mm. Yes. And um, that's why we'll see in terms of the uh, employment of mm. 85 percent of, mm. of employment comes from the MSME. So mm. yeah. that's why we need to celebrate them. Mm. We need to ensure because they are the one who make sure that we get our food on the table. Okay. Mm. Um oh. the other thing is mm. the contribution to the GDP. Mm. So they contribute 40% to the GDP in terms of ensuring mm -hmm. that uh, uh, though that needs to be, because if we are saying 98% is, is from... Yeah, is it's from, only contributing 30%. Then 40%, mm -hmm. that, that at 40%. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think there's need for us to ensure that the, we, they are growing. Mm -hmm. We ensure that uh, uh, we grow uh, the small bit from micro mm -hmm. to small, mm -hmm. Uh, from small to medium, 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 medium to now to yeah, yeah, we need to ensure that we are putting. It's also interesting to find out. I mean, the the threshold for small uh, SMEs is eight hundred million. I mean, I wonder how that number came about because I would imagine if uh, if I had a business that was making five hundred million in a year. I would consider that big, but I don't know what the parameters would be. Maybe seems it, like it came at a point when the dollar was at eighty bob. Yes, mm. yes. So but, yeah, though looking at. Um, uh, in the the, the global mm. statistics, uh, even our large corporates, SMEs in other in other markets, mm. yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> mm. annual turnover of eight hundred million yeah. is it's high. So we are thinking about ten million dollars. Yeah. Yep. Because mm. I guess I was going to ask then the role then that um, these enterprises, these businesses play in the economy of the nation and we're looking at Kenya today mm -hmm. because if we're going to say that there's a certain amount of support that they require to then get from micro to small from mm -hmm. small mm -hmm. uh, then the question is what is that and we already established you know here in terms of numbers who works for this business and uh, how much they make but if we could color it a little bit who are we talking about when we look at the landscape of Kenya here? Which businesses are we talking about that fall into these spaces for whom the support is needed? And then what kind of support are we talking about? We know that one of the biggest challenges towards progression for business is access to credit, right? But what other challenges are we looking at coming off of? What businesses are we talking about? Are we talking about the guy in his office with a laptop? Are we talking about the lady with a basket of tomatoes that she must sell? Are we talking about the milk vendor who goes from point A to point B? The cart pusher? Who? Who are we speaking of? Um, I think different uh, uh, dif the sizes of different uh, businesses require different support. Mm -hmm. And um, But if you look at um, uh, the micro yeah. where the mama burgers and because that's where they fall in, uh, uh, in terms of micro, mm. and uh, um, the Buddha Buddhas and all those. Mm -hmm. uh, the support they require, and uh, if, you if you look at e even the 98%, majority of the business falls under micro. Mm -hmm. And mm. they die within, uh, once you start most of those businesses, mm -hmm. die within five, five years. years. Five years. Why? Because of lack of adequate support for them to for them to to grow and thrive mm. so what's that now so now what's that support are we talking about uh, best business practices training are we talking about uh, personnel management are we talking about credit what are the reasons we would say that most of these businesses at the end of five years cease to exist uh, uh what we have noted is it there are different uh, 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 reasons mm. and they look uh, you cannot just provide someone credit and you think that they will drive because you have given them credit mm. they need to to have skills uh, to also uh, ensure that they are operating and uh, uh, ensuring that they are managing their financing they are able to to repay uh, they are able to also opportunities mm. for their market uh, because opportunities uh, for their product uh, you can have a very good product but if you don't sell then mm. that will not mean anything yeah. so you and opportunities could be there but you don't have the skills to to see those opportunities mm. so th and also the policies 
there are policies that could that are not supporting uh, the small businesses mm. so different mileage of of issues mm. that uh, uh, that looks at the the, the, the businesses mm. and uh, hamper them for growth and yet so, we, so we have to deal with them mm. holistically you, you cannot deal with one the same brushes yes them. with all of them yes this is something that has been talked about and appears to be understood by many mm -hmm. from economists to government people in policy to find the people in the financial services sector all of them talk about you know the need to support the micro and small enterprises so that they can grow but does it actually happen apart from seeing those you know private institutions that come in you know to try and bridge the gap people like sandbox and others who come and try and bridge the gap in terms of capacity building mm -hmm. and all mm -hmm. is there a proper policy framework that supports the identification of micro enterprises the support of micro enterprises and seeing how they are walking the journey with their micro enterprises to become small small to become medium is there a policy framework for that i know there's an msme act secondly with the kind of confusion that you've just alluded to in the financial services sector is it because of a lack of harmony in the policy front um uh, from my end, if you look at uh, the policy framework, I think the policy framework is there. Mm. What we uh, we lack is adequate funding for the uh, uh, micro, small, and enterprise authority to be able to ensure that they implement the different things. Remember, even in the uh, in the uh, MSME Act, uh, MSEA, which is micro, small, and, and enterprise authority. Mm. Uh, is supposed to be learning a fund so that they support they support the businesses which is not yet uh, fully in place so lack of adequate funding for the that institution makes because the other institutions uh, which are supporting uh, businesses in different angles they also don't have um, um, adequate funding so in terms of uh, ensuring that they they are doing all uh, they are implementing the activities in scale it's, it's very limited so we will find uh, 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 despite having seven million uh, business offer 700 mil, uh, 7 million businesses, mm -hmm. probably you will only find less than 100,000 that are being supported mm -hmm. by different stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So in terms of support, they still very, in terms of numbers, mm -hmm. very low numbers that are supported. So what does that point to? Is that a failure of understanding the policy? Mm -hmm. Because I've actually looked up at the policy. There's a 2020 policy. Mm -hmm. 2020 is just the other day. Mm -hmm. Um is this policy actually understood? Was the MSME Act revised to fit into the policy? No. It, it, the, the, the MSME Act is yet to be revised. Uh, uh, and the policy in terms of implementation, I think, is still uh, not uh, in terms of even being known uh, by uh, the people who are supposed to benefit from it. It's not yet known. Even the MSMEs and uh, most of the policy people may may have uh, inadequate knowledge about it. Mm. So there is need for even sensitization about the policy so that people know what that policy means mm. and what it means to them. Mm. And how then do you ensure that we coordinate all institutions to ensure that they support the policy yeah. because that's the coordination aspect is also a very mm -hmm. that's why you will find few uh, uh, institutions supporting and they support the same uh, <laughs> businesses you will mm -hmm. find businesses that get support move from one institutions to, a, to another to another mm -hmm. So because of lack of that coordination. Right. Yeah. Let's take a break at this point. 27 minutes to 8. It's World MSME Day and Harrison Gatti is the head of SME Development at the Kenya Private Sector Alliance. He's our guest this morning. He had to talk about the need to support and finance MSMEs in Kenya. This is Kenya's biggest conversation. The Situation Room will be back shortly. Our guest host, Wangari Muikia from the EGCL Institute, here with us until the end of the show. This is The Situation Room, the only way to start your day.
the London Mulu DJ Absolute. When the gang is together, you got the sugar, you got the spice. Your Honor. Yes. I have missed you like hot hamburgers. Yeah? <laughs> like hot hamburgers. <laughs> You know, bad boys give Take more money than you can count. Hey, bad boys <laughs> give more money than you can count. If it's fun, it's funky, it's fresh, you're definitely going to catch it here. I don't know what you do every day from 11 a.m. to 3 o'clock, but if I were you, I'd tune in to Sugar and Spice only on 94.4. At 13 in Nairobi, highs of 23, highs of 25 in a cloudy Nakuru at 16. It's 14 and cloudy in Yeri, highs of 22, and we'll see highs of 24 in a partly cloudy Elder. It's at 14. At 23, it's a cloudy morning in Mombasa, highs of 28, and highs of 28 in a cloudy Malindi. Looking into Kisumu, it's partly cloudy at 19, highs of 29, and Kakamega is 17 and cloudy, highs of 28. 19 and partly cloudy in Kampala, highs of 27, and highs of 29 in a cloudy Dar es Salaam at 23. It's a chilly Monday at 7 in Johannesburg, highs of 17, and Lagos is cloudy at 25 with highs of 29. And we'll look at the same in Kinshasa, where it's 22 and cloudy, highs of 30, and lows of 21. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94.4. Spice right, up. We saw the messiest of it on the thicker superhighway this morning. Not looking too bad right about now. There's a beehive of activity right in the middle of the CBD. And we're still seeing traffic coming off the thicker superhighway, heavy past the outer ring junction. And then well in there, just past Garden City. Your service lanes are going to help out today quite some. So you want to use those. Campbell Road also has packed up all the way then from trickling in from the junction of Ruaka Road out then towards DCI. All right, uh, coming off Langata Road, you should be all right, but we're going to bump into some of it, of all that traffic that's coming off of Magadi Road, and it's going to go slowly as you go towards Raila Odinga Way or then out towards the city. Let's keep an eye. Help us out here to keep things moving. Spice FMKE on Twitter. up your life mature intelligent talk every morning spice up yourself Minutes to the the 94.4 Spice FM. Harrison Gatia, head of SME Development at the Kenya Private Sector Alliance. We are talking about the need to support and finance MSMEs in Kenya, and that's what we've been discussing. You talked about, you know, lack of coordination in terms of po at policy level, at implementation level, at the various actors level. Paint for us the picture. If there was actual proper coordination, what would we see? Um, what we would see is um, um, in terms of um, support to the uh, to the MSMEs, we'll see that um, uh, the numbers that are supported, and uh, we can see the growth from micro to small to uh, to medium to large. Mm -hmm. It's well coordinated in a way that we can see uh, uh, we have provided uh, this number of uh, probably in terms of amount uh, um, in terms of credit from for this section we have provided skills uh, to this uh, especially to the micro and small mm -hmm. so that they can scale uh, uh, how do we also ensure that we support them to get markets for the products and services uh, and we can quantify in terms of um, the support from each level to the other so that we can see we are working towards growing and ensuring that we are moving from micro mm. to medium to large. Mm. So yeah. ideally what we should be seeing today yes. is yes. like say a report from the ministry in charge of SMEs talking about the progress saying in the last one year yes. what we have seen is growth of organizations that were 
categorize as small mm -hmm. becoming medium mm -hmm. x percentage of mm -hmm. small com companies mm -hmm. in the last three years mm -hmm. have graduated to medium yeah. medium have graduated to large mm -hmm. and we have a new entry of x, x number of micro enterprises then we'd be seeing a clear growth yeah and also sector. the support that each category has got. has been receiving yes yes mm. Mm. yeah and, and to follow up um you know earlier we were reading in the paper about uh the government providing border border uh riders mm. you know i think they fall within the micro mm -hmm. uh, in enterprises they're providing nhif uh and training have you had any input into that kind of conversation and and does that help in your mind or in your experience these border borders to then make that progression like what what is your thinking around the support that is being given to the board i'm sure i don't know if you read in the papers that uh, the president is uh, yes. you know providing yes, a, i think 100,000 electric bikes mm -hmm. plus support with um, uh, nhif and training I think that's a good move because what we have seen uh, the border border riders, if you look at the border border uh, industry, there has been a lot of accident in that in that uh, industry uh, uh, due to a lack of training and lack of understanding how they need to maneuver in the streets. So the, uh, a lot of uh, issues around that. So having the training and also having an HIF is a good move. Uh, and we think I think we need um, um, even to scale that and ensure that um, uh, the Buddha Buddhas are getting more of that countrywide mm -hmm. uh, because any support that will re re reduce um, accident uh, one they reduce the expenses that uh, the, the riders uh, uh, in car, mm -hmm. in terms of treating the uh, the, uh, the, the the accident, uh, uh, and they're also looking at uh, if they get accidents, what mm -hmm. mean what it means for them. Uh, mostly, if um, a, a rider is bedridden, they are not able to provide to their family mm -hmm. for the, the days mm -hmm. that they. Mm -hmm. So, uh, getting trainings to be able to ensure that they are safe, mm -hmm. I think, is a good move. And also now, in, in HIF to cater for their their cost of of medical, mm -hmm. a very a very good move for. Uh, I, and I think yes. Th sorry, so, and I think that's interesting because even when you think about, uh, it, it may be good, but you're talking about the linkages of policy. Yes. And you know, recently we just had the finance uh, act passed mm -hmm. then you ask we are asking ourselves have how how in your analysis and in your reviews and your submissions I'm, I'm sure you interacted with the government on this how is the finance bill going to affect you know there's the, the petrol uh, mm -hmm. issue uh, there's uh, taxes being incurred and then they have to now uh, you know the, the costs are going to go up how are you supporting these groups you know it seems like they may fall even further than micro <laughs> you know they might fall out of business mm -hmm. so how are you what are you thinking around the finance bill and how are you mitigating that for the micro um, and small enterprises micro small and medium enterprises especially even in the conversation around the border borders okay I think I think um the most uh, 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 difficult moment, especially for the government, is how to balance the what they need to bring mm. and what they need to provide. So, in terms of taxation, they need to to balance. But in terms of uh, impact, if it's petrol, uh, uh, because we'll have the eight percent, that will impact the Boda Boda not only the border border every sector of the economy will be affected by that uh, so uh, um, looking for us is looking at the timing because the timing uh, uh, is usually the uh, the one that uh, break or make the businesses uh, looking at when do you put in place certain policies and, and measures to ensure that we are also supporting the business to grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So well as we everyone needs to pay tax to, to support the government to implement the different things, but also the timing uh, uh, needs to be mm -hmm. a bit fair to ensure that we are supporting the businesses. I'm, I'm a bit curious as to then how this would play out because a lot of times you want it, you know, practicality to say, okay, this is how then this support would be applied, right? Um, what, what would it look like? Say, for example, if you look at the different pillars that you've mentioned now in terms of the kind of support that's needed mm. for a lot of these businesses, and the bulk of them, um, is, did I get you right by saying the bulk of these businesses are micro? Micro, yes, yes. Okay. 
bulk of these businesses are micro there's a certain level of support that they need across board it could be at the beginning of their business it could be mid-cycle it could be you know uh, as you go ahead how would it happen do people uh, how would they receive this kind of support let's say today that there was agreement to say yes we know that this support is needed and mm -hmm. we're going to deliver it in one two three how would that happen um I think there are different programs that are learned. No? Mm. Uh, you will think about um, uh, uh, a program like Uwezo, we have a sort of okay. we have different programs that happen. Mm. But uh, I think we are having too many mm. programs mm -hmm. that in terms of now ensuring that uh, 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 the management cost is efficient. Is efficient. Mm. How do we ensure that we uh, we consolidate, Can we all, consolidate these, all these, all these, oh. to ensure that the support uh, is not uh, diluted mm -hmm. by the management of the. So team. I hear you saying that there's some mechanisms that are already in existing; they're already in place. Yes. But in terms of then consolidation and making sure that they're actually doing what they were uh, created to do, mm -hmm. uh, that would provide support for some of these organizations is not being done. So instead of reinventing the wheel, mm -hmm. as it were, mm -hmm. use because immediately I was thinking, so where is it going to come from? I mm -hmm. mean, finance bill has been passed. We don't have money. It's not going to happen there. But what you're saying is that things already exist mm -hmm. where they can be strengthened yes. or they can be used as they were originally envisioned to be used mm -hmm. to make sure that some of these things happen, right? Yes. What would be the ripple effect? What if today we saw that this 80% of micro businesses got the support that they needed, then became thriving businesses, or at, least the very, at the very least understood what they were supposed to be doing mm -hmm. in terms of business? What kind of changes in an economy, for example, would we see if this report that is being rather if this support that is being clamored for now was living and active mm -hmm. what kind of difference would we see in an economy today where your businesses are thriving uh i think one of the things that would see and uh, if you note from the developed country because they also have the similar uh structure in terms of the the number of businesses uh, smes and, and and the large corporates mm. uh, in terms of uh uh contribution to the GDP, uh, the developed economies, SME, contribute uh, 50% over 50%. So what that means is that uh, uh, everyone will be able to, to thrive in terms of they can be able to, uh, to pay for their uh, service, to feed for their children, to, to build their own houses. So there will be very little effect in every sector of the economy because mm -hmm. people can afford different things for their, for their needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there's also now, uh, there's the funding that you've talked about. There are various funds. Hustler Fund is the latest one. Yes. Uh, before that, there was a fund of 2013. Mm. Mm. Then Women Enterprise Fund. You have to use the fund. Youth Enterprise Development Fund. Oh, yes. Four funds. Yes. In 1965, there was a Kenya Industrial Estates that was established to support MSME mm. growth mm. across the country. We have a multiplicity of things that are taking place. Now, how can we actually harmonize all these things? For example, today, are all these funds being run by the Ministry of MSMEs? Mm -hmm. Are they? Apart but from the Hustler Fund that we know is under the MSME mm -hmm. ministry. No, no, no. Is the Weso Fund under MSME ministry? No. Is the Youth Enterprise Development Fund under MSME ministry? Mm -hmm. Is the Women Enterprise Fund? Under, so who's, ru who's running them? Even yeah, this Agpo. There's <laughs> the Agpo support for, you know, contracting in government. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, I think that's what I was saying in terms of if we can consolidate all these mm -hmm. because I think the, the impact would be higher if they are consolidated and learned by one station because of the management aspect. The only, probably the only aspect, and uh, most of them I know they, they are supporting, even, even the women are, the women uh, fund is supporting women in businesses, uh, youth fund is supporting Youth in businesses. Mm -hmm. So why don't we consolidate all these funds and ensure that we land them in a very efficient, and they can be able to reach more businesses in terms of support, so that we can see uh, mm -hmm. more funds being utilized for business support than l managing the funds. I, I think. Are you suggesting that because they're not consolidated, they're not being run professionally? Not, not. I think we are losing efficiency by. Uh, by, by learning them separately. How? 
How are we losing efficiency? In terms of like uh, hmm. um, uh, from uh, from my management and and and, uh, and, and staffing and all those, hmm. there is duplication of efforts. Not really. There are different funds focusing on different groups of people. And I was thinking that in terms, if I were to use a term specialization. How different, city? Different in this sense. Hmm. If you're dealing with youth, whether it is men and women, mm -hmm. one entity. Okay. Women alone. Maybe you need to categorize it and say, when we say women, we mm. mean this and this and the other. You specialize it. But these funds are specialized funds. They, they, they were set up to focus in, on specific areas. The diversity of individuals we have in the economy, in my mind, that's the idea. If you consolidate them the way I'm thinking, you'll confuse things even more. Because mm. now, you'll have a situation where yeah. one goes there, they're not quite sure who to see and, and, and who to talk to. They will be directed. Then, if you're going to even by the Ascari at the door, should I call mm -hmm. and uh, counter five? Yes, mm -hmm. just yes. like Huduma. Do you know how Huduma works? I have absolutely no Huduma idea. Center. <laughs> <laughs> Are we ever in touch to a Huduma? To a Huduma, Huduma, Huduma Center. Center. I, I know it is, but I've never, yeah. Had if the need. you go to a Huduma, there are over so many counters mm. for different things mm. which support and you'll be told if you want this service i want uh, to get a, a birth not birth certificate mm. go to counter x mm. go to counter x if you want um any other service i've lost my id i want to replace yes. id i've interacted with the citizen which mm. does exactly what you're saying uh -huh. Yes. And you got confused? No, I didn't get confused. Okay. Yes. Yes. So, so <laughs> consolidation means that there will be, actually, it's only that there needs to be clear. Like, actually, you've got it. This is really where I was getting to. You yes. see, all these things, it's not that any of these creations are intended for evil. They're intended for good. But the communication and the understanding of how one can benefit from them is usually what hampers this entire process. You know it exists. What do you do with it? You know you, you, you are supposed to. What do you do with it? So when we talk about all these institutions that the government has set up to help the so-called Monenchi, the communication aspect to ensure the Monenchi understands how to benefit from it is the one thing that is solely lacking. Saying it exists, you've told us absolutely nothing. It's like telling me a bank exists, so. It's telling me a circle exists, so. And also the formalities, you know, the process of getting each of them has a different, yes, yes, different yes. regulations. Yes, yes. Yeah. the regulations for accessing funding. women fund, yes, Uwezo fund, youth enterprise fund, different. hustler fund, different. Mm. The management of all these ones different. If you just look at what Harrison is saying in terms of efficiency costs, mm. X amount of money has been put into the youth enterprise development fund. Yes. But they are spending some of it. A small percentage, yes, it's been ring fences, so a small percentage. That small percentage is paying rent somewhere, it's paying staff somewhere, it's paying. And there are some staff who really are not like servicing many people in a day. Same thing is happening with Wezo. Same thing is happening with the Women Fund. Now, if you put them under one, if all of them were under Chalugui's ministry, for example, and there was a coordination with one principal secretary, and then going down, it would be more efficient communication would even be better even so you better. know what you're getting into you know the fund still exists separately mm -hmm. if you're a woman and you're looking for a woman enterprise fund you go if you're youth and you're looking for youth enterprise development fund here and i think also coupled with that is access because a lot of the people who actually need this uh, funds may not be able to come to the city or even know how to fill in the application mm -hmm. maybe even mm -hmm. literacy is mm -hmm. a problem so even access to you know be able to apply for those funds i think is something yeah, that's it's, of it's, it's something that yeah uh, one of the hidden for especially the micro businesses mm. uh, is how to access the fu the funding mm. may be there but, but they may not they may know where to go but they may not even know where to start mm. yep once they go there and they they fear even Harrison. going to those offices mm. 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 yes all these enterprises have unions circles the groupings all in this country, mm. two people sneeze, turning on the right hand side, <laughs> they a form. They, 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 there's, they, they, a there's a circle. There's a circle for it. <laughs> who sneeze on the right hand side? <laughs> what are the efforts that are being made to educate the formation of these people? Because they know their members better than any of us do. Yes, they are the best people to communicate this very same thing. Because you can't go to each and every one of those people, but within the formations that they belong to. They can be communicated to. I am certain this is, is, is already being done. Mm -hmm. But 
to what degree is it being done? Because we keep talking about how people default, how people don't do this. Part of it has to do with ignorance. It's not as though someone sets out to default. Is there continuous education for just the processes of managing a business and ensuring that you understand financial probity and all these things? Is there enough effort being made within the units, the formation these people belong to, to ensure that they actually continuously learn and understand how to go about these things in a better way? Uh, as I said, it's very inadequate. It's there, but uh, we need more. And the communication aspect that you are saying, how do we ensure that government works with different associations, yeah. different, uh, different unions, different uh, groups? Uh, because most of, uh, especially the micro, operates in groups. Uh, how do you ensure that uh, uh, they can communicate some of those things and ensure that they learn sensitizations with them? Uh, and they reach out to more, many more people. We I'm sure if we ask them, each of them, we bring the youth fund boss here, we bring the hustler fund boss mm -hmm. here, all of them will tell you that they are doing this. Mm -hmm. The Kenya Industrial Estate is on their uh, website, kie.co.ke. Here they say that they have trained over 4,000 SMEs countrywide. Mm. Okay. Now, a youth fund will tell us the same kind of figure. Mm -hmm. Imagine if all those training budgets mm -hmm. were consolidated so it becomes one big budget and one well-coordinated yeah. training, training effort and marketing mm -hmm. effort. Imagine how big it would be. If, if we have an, an institution, City, you keep reminding us, 1965. In fact, I've gone there. Yeah. <laughs> go the website. Kenya Industrial Estate was established by the government of Kenya mm -hmm. in 1967 yep. with a mandate to promote small and medium industries with a focus on rural industrialization. MSMEs have emerged to be key strategic drivers of socioeconomic transformation in developing nations. How much have they? 20 million, uh, 50,000 to 20 million shillings in revenue funding, 35 SME parks and sheds and incubators across the country. So these ones have a network. They do. And experience. They do. So you bring all these funds under these guys. Yeah. No. But it, uh, it exactly. <laughs> right. you see, this is a because, uh, because a lot of times, which you've talked about as well, uh, communication and awareness of some of these things could be the hindrance not that there is no support but that because mm -hmm. there is no awareness of that said support that is what the challenge actually is we talk about other funds in this country where people have been and one of those is education bursary year the president the county the constituency mm -hmm. everybody's all over the place doing their own thing but then there's a case to be made for consolidation because you have a central place whereby everybody can go and get information mm -hmm. and in that one place you can categorize it if you wish mm -hmm. because then different businesses under this one consolidation can get the information and support that they need. Is there no case to be made for that? In this country? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is there no case to be made for it? Uh, no, I think, uh, mm. as you said, information mm. gap is, is big. It, it is term of uh, the businesses. Mm. And one of the things that we are also trying to support, uh, uh, to provide our support is uh, ensuring that we have a, a platform where a business can be able to to go and see what are the types of funding opportunities that are available for their businesses and uh, also the business development services that are available. So uh, uh, through partnership with International Trade Center, uh, we have just created the MSME financing gateway, mm -hmm. which you can be able to uh, log in and uh, once you log in with your details, it will be able to match uh, the different needs that you have. And you can search on the available opportunities. So it's something that we launched in April, and we are hoping that we shall, we shall close that information gap as we continue. Uh, we know right now we have started uh, from our web, and we, we want to see how do we ensure that we reach even to the micro by ensuring that they can be able to, to query through the Kababe. Uh, so it's a work in progress, mm -hmm. and uh, we are looking at scaling, but we have already started, and we are ensuring that uh, we should be able to cross uh, or bridge that information uh, gap that is available in the market. And this is with support from uh, which institutions again? International Trade Center, ITC. In International Trade Center? Yeah, it's a, it's a body under UN. Okay. So how does one get support now through CAPSA if, you know, somebody who's running a small micro enterprise is listening and they'd like to get on into this kind of support, how do they do it? Uh, we should learn different programs and uh, at CAPSA. 
and um, um, we learn we learn them through the social media through mm. the website and um, uh, just like Mike, uh, the MSME financing gateway we'll be uh, launching a new program uh, that will be looking at uh, bridging the financing gap especially for uh, those who cannot be able to uh, access the commercial yeah. uh, for uh, what we intend to do is to uh, ensure that we are able to support them and uh, move them to commercial so that we can be able to support more uh, so it will be a five year program we'll be launching very soon mm. and uh, looking at uh, also we are running different capacity building programs how do we ensure that uh, different uh, businesses are invested in the weather for uh, financing from the uh, the banks yeah. or from different funding uh, opportunities that are available whether mm. it's equity um so it's something that we are working on and how do we also ensure that uh, they can be uh, take care of, uh, they can take advantage of the uh, afcta mm. Africa, <laughs> so continental free trade, yeah, free trade area. Yeah, free, yeah, yeah. So. Harrison, we thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, thank you. For Harrison Gatia is the head of SME development at the Kenya Private Sector Alliance. He's been our guest in the World MSME Day. Keep it here for more conversations coming up in the next hour. It's eight a.m. Spice up your life. Good morning, this is the Newswire. I'm Lea Obaga. The Departmental Committee on Health will today meet with Health CS Susan Nahumicha and top management of the NHIF. The meetup will see them discuss, among other issues, the non-remittance of NHIF capitations to hospitals providing services to cardholders, review of cash flow statements for the past two years, and assessment of any existing financial reserve policies. Nahumicha and other officials will also be tasked with expressing concerns regarding hospital's refusal to accept NHIF cards and the recent cancellation of NHIF recruitment for the CEO and senior management directors. Azimio MPs from Western Kenya have hit out at President William Ruto for signing into law the 2023 Finance Bill led by Likuyani MP Innocent Mugabe. They say that it's unfortunate that the President chose to ignore the cry of Kenyans by increasing taxes on petroleum products from 8 to 16 percent among others. Tayari tunajua gharama ya maisha iko juu. Chilingi kwa dola imeanguka na mafuta tunalipa na dola. Sasa umeongeza bei ya dola, tena umeongeza tax ya petroli. Kila kitu kinapanda. Sasa unasaidia mwananchi ama unamuumiza zaidi? Kila siku tukiamka kwa gazeti scandal baada ya scandal. Mimi ningekuwa William Samoe Ruto, hii mwaka ya kwanza singerudi kwa wananchi. Ningeonyesha wananchi kwamba I'm determined to finish corruption. He further called on Kenyans to turn up in large numbers for the Kamkunji meeting that will see them announce their next move today. The sovereign power of the country rests with the people. Ni watu wana practice that sovereign power through their members of parliament. Lakini pia yoka timba inaruhusu, awa bunga wakishindua kuwa represent vizuri wanaichi wejewe, wanaruhusiwa kujitoa, kujiakilisha. Na hivi karibuni kitakiwa hiwe hivyo, sisi tutakuja, tuwaiche kama wanaichi, pia njini muweze kujiakilisha kama wanaichi wejewe. Kama itamanisha tuandamane, tuafaya nini? Tuandamane. A report released by the Auditor General has blown the lead on massive corruption, malpractice and poor management in water and sanitation companies across various counties. The report, which has been adopted by the Senate Public Investment Committee, revealed that private companies in collaboration with corrupt county officials have been engaging in malpractices and embezzling, and embezzling the 47 counties in excess of 47 billion shillings in lost revenue. Some of the counties that have been flagged for malpractice and embezzlement include Wajia, Murang, Nairobi and Taita Taveta. And a couple and their son are being held by police after they allegedly beat to death one of their siblings over missing 50 shillings in Nyamira County. Police said the incident happened in Igane Itambe village where the 17-year-old boy died after a beating. The deceased elder brother reported his 50 shillings was missing and the suspect was his younger brother. This prompted the brother to start a fight with the deceased before their parents joined in the beating. Kimilili MP Didmas Barasa has criticized the security officers in Kamukunya 
sorry, area for negligence in their work even as residents continue to be troubled by criminal groups. Addressing the residents, Baraza asked the area police commander to be fully responsible for his duties instead of claiming that he does not have a car to accomplish his duties. And in the international scene, the head of U.S. intelligence says that there is no evidence that the COVID-19 virus was created in the Chinese government's Wuhan Research Lab. In a declassified report, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence said they had no information backing recent claims that three scientists at the lab were some of the very first infected with COVID-19 and may have created the virus themselves. The report made for Congress and carrying an unreleased classified annex came three months after lawmakers demanded a fuller explanation of the U.S. intelligence information on the origins of the pandemic which erupted at the end of 2019. That's the Newswire. I'm Lea Obaga. One hundred two point five Spice FM. Kisumu from Jogo Road went to Lungalunga, and now we're seeing the spillover towards Likoni. It's touching on the interchange going towards the southern bypass. So there's going to be uh, quite some of that right about now. We're also looking at a heavy coming off of North Airport Road going towards Outer Ring, and then also towards the eastern bypass. We're looking at traffic that's heavy also. Then coming off of Langata Road, all of this spilling over from Magadi Road going down Langata Road out towards Aerodrome, and then onto Huru High. Highway. It's heavy also then coming off of Gong Road, really into traffic hour proper right now. In and outbound traffic is heavy on Kiambu Road. And we're looking at less of it on the thicker superhighway, but it's heavy after survey through towards Pangani. All right, James Kishiro, busy over to the um, over to Waiakue, spilling over a little bit towards Red Hill on the Link Road. And the Northern Bypass has not given up all morning. So we're still looking at that. We're going to be there for some time from all we see. If you left early, you're looking at it from where you are. If you didn't, you're in the middle of it. Let's hear where you might be stuck this morning or where you find a good route. And let's talk on Spice FMKE on Twitter. This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga. Researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power. And Eric Latif, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. Good this morning. Is Welcome the situation to the room. Of the, situation the only room. way to start your day. Day of June 2023. Have you heard what we are telling you about Colgate and the partnership that they have with Naivas? Basically, Colgate are running this campaign where they are raising funds to go and support the establishment of water services for 150,000 people in the country. They want to go and help in putting up 30 water pumps and water wells in uh, this for these communities and all they're asking for you is to support them in this 30 water wells that will provide clean water for over 150,000 people now that's something to smile about you know because when people don't have access to potable water it's a big thing it's a big thing and Colgate have decided no let's do something about it so every time you go to Nivas and you buy a tube of Colgate part of that 
will go towards this particular endeavor. And they're telling you you can actually buy uh, at your nearest Naivas physical store or you can go online and Naivas and you can then purchase. And anytime you buy, buy exclusively at Naivas, it helps them. You can get more information by going to www.colgate.ke and you get all information there. Our next guest is the acting CEO of the Kenya Medical Supplies Authority. Dr. Andrew Muloa is in the studio. Good morning. Good morning, Eric. Welcome to the hot seat of Kenya's biggest conversation. Thank you. I think uh, I used to think this is the hot seat. I am now in a hotter seat. <laughs> <laughs> you thought this was hot? Yes. Until? I went to Kemsa mm -hmm. and uh, realized that there uh, are hotter seats out there. But how hot is it? You're actually right now not even dealing with Kemsa issues. You're dealing with what you were doing before as a director of medical services. Uh, to be honest, uh, I am dealing with Kemsa. I am dealing with Kemsa and I'm focused on Kemsa and working on transformation of Kemsa. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact is I was the director of medical services, prevention and promotive health in the Ministry of Health. I did what I could at the time. And what's coming is questions around some of the actions uh, that I did when I was there. Mm -hmm. Are they my preoccupation? No. My preoccupation is uh, how to turn around KEMSA to be the vibrant organization that it's supposed to be, to be the organization that will deliver medicines to the most remote part of the country when required, in the right quantity, in the right, uh, at the right time, and in the right quality that is my focus well so done. your uh, communications person is clapping right <laughs> <now>. <laughs> he got the brief right he's executed it very well yes. very well said <laughs> we'll have the conversations going forward <laughs> wangari moikia is our guest host today wangari is an economist she's a lead partner with egcl institute she's worked in all those places yes. at the national treasury yeah. with the Bretton woods institutions studied in those big institutions called the big institutions. Ivy League institutions. <laughs> mm. Am I the guest here? here. I'm and, now here. <laughs> and I'm introducing you to yeah. Dr. Muloa. You know, you know, so that he knows who is asking the questions to him. <laughs> City, please give Dr. Harry the day's problem. Uh, yes. I, I didn't work for the... <laughs> 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 you didn't study in... Uh, <laughs> no, I did not. <laughs> in the Ivy League? No, no, no. Okay. I did not. Uh, schools. Yes, yes. <laughs> I went to a primary school in okay. Kenya here. Yeah. Right. The proverb of the day, our proverbs of the whole of this week, Dr. Tari, are from the country of Chad. I have been accused of favoring Chad. And I said in my defense, they have some of the most interesting proverbs I've ever, ever come across. And let me mention today's proverb and tell me what, whether you think it's interesting or not. There is no such thing as a small fire or a small woman. <laughs> I will need to take my time. <laughs> Very advisable. Let's do this. I am eh? a man. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's make this proverb into two. <laughs> let's start with the first half. There is no small fire. Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, indeed true. And uh, in our language we, uh, and around here, they say where there is fire, there, there is smoke, there is fire. So, I mean, uh, when. Uh, Issues are said, uh, issues, you start hearing issues, however small they are. Digging deeper may uh, give you what they say, uh, uh, the iceberg. Mm. Uh, and it would be any small issue that you see could be a pointer to big issue, bigger issues. Then uh, again, I will not speak on the, there is no small woman, because I am a man. Hey. Okay. That's another proverb. Crickets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Crickets. Let's start straight into it, Dr. So you are appointed acting CEO of the Kenya Medical Supplies Authority. You'll tell us what you're doing to transform this cancer and what is the problem that you're going to cure. But right now, you are, every single day, you are either appearing before the National Assembly, before Senate, there's an investigation into what led to the dismissal of your predecessor in the office that you're currently occupying. What is the issue? I, I think uh, the, the, the main issue, as it is, is the issue of uh, the mass net or uh, the uh, long-lasting insecticidal nets, which... Uh, 
wa is a it's a program that uh, the country runs every three years uh, the last campaign having been 2020 2021 then uh previously i think 2017 or there about 2014 every three years mm -hmm. there is a mass distri campaign distribution mm -hmm. uh, mass net distribution across 27 counties that are malaria endemic mm -hmm. And uh, it's usually a big program, talking about uh, between 15 and 18 million nets uh, per cycle, because usually targets every household uh, in these regions. It's a program that is aligned to one, the WHO uh, malaria eradication strategy. Uh, is also a program that uh, uh, is aligned to Kenyan strategy for malaria el elimination, and uh, has really helped in terms of reducing the prevalence of malaria in the country as uh, among other strategies mm. of course i was here i think the other day the last time we were here we were talking about vaccines the malaria vaccine mm -hmm. uh, being one of them and many other among us the lavicidin and other uh, strategies that are applied in malaria elimination mm. this year's uh, campaign uh, is supported by two partners uh, the global fund is supporting about 10.2 million nets and uh, the USID uh, PMI project, Presidential Malaria Initiative, is supporting about uh, 4 million uh, nets. Mm. Of course, that uh, leaves us with a deficit of about uh, 4 million nets, which uh, is at the time that I was a ministry, because our target was to do 18.2 million nets. Mm. So we are uh, still looking for resources to cover the gap. Uh, in terms of uh, this particular uh, global fund yeah. procurement uh, the ministry of health and the malaria pro program is a sub recipient of a global fund grant mm -hmm. uh, which supports uh, many activities uh, supporting the counties uh, uh, capacity building uh, training on case management uh, developing tools for policy around malaria mm. so the grant has that component that supports activities within the program mm. then also the grant has a, pro, a, 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 a component that supports commodities in terms of anti-malarial drugs malaria test kits uh, uh, lab support for malaria and also now for this routine for these uh, periodic activities like MassNet, the grant is supposed to was supposed to support uh, Initially, it was 12.6 million nets. Mm. Mm -hmm. But because of price and uh, the available resources, uh, could only support 10.2 million nets. Mm. Last year in October, we initiated because we have to, at the end of uh, at every financial year, first we have to develop what we call <laughs> a, a work plan. Mm. Then from a work plan, you develop a procurement plan. And based on the global fund budget, I think that was done in the beginning of the, fin of the financial year. Mm. Uh, once we got the approval, we had to initiate procurement mm. as per procurement plan. Because these funds, the principal recipient of these funds, of these grants, <coughs> have some flu help with not COVID. All <laughs> hope so. Preventative, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, the, this re request has to go through the national treasury mm. the national treasury are the principal recipients of the global fund grants and uh, kenya has developed uh, uh specifications for procure for for mass net for for nets for anyone who wants to support a net distribution program you have this policy document that you just go and pick mm. and you are good to go Okay. and make choice uh, of the nets that you want to distribute. And this is developed by the Ministry? It's the Ministry of Health. Mm -hmm. The last uh, version that we have was developed in 2016. Okay. And this is what we used in October mm -hmm. to write to the Principal Secretary asking her now to, to ask Treasury to initiate the procurement okay. of nets. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, that was before, during the transition period, so it was before the, uh, the current uh, and previous uh, okay. PSs. Mm -hmm. When that came, uh, I think the PS for uh, not I think the PS on the twelfth of October forwarded the specifications mm -hmm. as per the uh, policy document which I already shared uh, to Treasury to procure 
uh, at the time the request was 12.6 million nets mm -hmm. but after a review of the re available resources between treasury uh, in consultation with the ministry and uh, camp uh, and, and, and global fund uh, team in geneva uh, we settled on uh, 12.10.2 uh, million nets i think after that as a ministry we have already returned to the uh, and I was involved because I was the director responsible for this program. Mm -hmm. The program uh, head of program came up with the specifications. Of course, forwarded the specifications as per the policy document to me, and I forwarded to the principal secretary. The principal secretary forwarded. You, you know that channel, mm -hmm. that all bureaucracy. The way, all the way to Kemsa. Mm -hmm. All the way to Treasury, then from Treasury to Kemsa. Okay. Uh, when uh, doctor, just pause for a second. In this structure that you mention, the person in charge of programs writes to you. He writes to you to, to tell you? you this is what we need. Yes. That somebody who work whose program director mm. in charge of malaria. Malaria prevention. Malaria program. You as director of promotive and preventive, and preventative yeah. you then write to the PS. You scale it up. To the PS, yes. What powers do you have as director beyond writing? Beyond writing, I'm the technical advisor. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I don't just forward any document that comes mm -hmm. to me. Yes. Every document that passes through my desk, I have to look at it, consult. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why we have technical advisors within mm -hmm. the office. Mm -hmm. you, you consult, the, the, you have discussions, seek clarification on issues that are not clear. And that, that, that is basically... Do, do you document these processes of discussions with your experts and advisors? Because, uh, one, when I get a written document, uh, because it's, it's now in writing, mm. I act in writing as well. So if I'm not satisfied with the question, I ask the question. Either direct in the memo or develop another memo mm. to mm. question in writing. Because... It presented in writing, you <laughs> respond in writing. Every if I need a, a discussion, mm. I mark it. Is that Let's why government documents, you find a piece of paper, yes. there are all sorts of comments yes. on it. Yes, mm. yes. Mm. Everyone it goes yes. to write yes. their own little yes. comments. Yes, yes. yes. Aha. It's important. So it's communicated in writing. It's mm. communicated in writing. Now we can resume. Okay, letter has gone to PS. Yes. PS, PS has forwarded. forwarded. PS Treasury. has forwarded. Yes, okay. Treasury do their own uh, consultations with Global Fund and all, everything, then they write to their procuring agency. Okay. Who's procuring agency? Their procuring agency is called KEMSA. Treasury's procuring agency is, is KEMSA. called KEMSA for okay. Global Fund. All right. Is oh, it okay. Treasuries or is it the Ministry of Health? Uh, that's what it, where, where it we want funds? to... For purposes of Global Fund. Mm -hmm. For purposes of Global Fund. For purposes of Global Fund. Yes. KEMSA is an agent, procurement agent for the National Treasury. Okay. Okay. Yes. And why is the National Treasury involved? Because they are the principal recipient. There are three principal re recipients in, uh, for Global Fund in Kenya. Two non-state and one state. The state pr principal recipient is the National Treasury. Okay. The non-state, you have, must have had the Kenya Red Cross yeah. and AMREF yes. are the other uh, principal recipients. So, so the money does not come to Treasury. All Treasury, oh, I mean to the Ministry of Health. No. All Ministry of Health money is nestled in the Treasury. In the Treasury. Okay. okay. And that's why I first just started by describing there are program activities, mm. which now the Ministry acts as a sub-recipient. Treasury tells you, because I cannot implement malaria things, I cannot implement mm -hmm. activities on TB, I cannot, yeah. 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 they yeah. give the money as a sub-recipient. Mm. Uh, for procurements, for these anti-malaria things, they are done by Treasury. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's why Treasury has a unit on Global Fund with technical people, doctors, mm -hmm. sitting in Treasury. Mm -hmm. Because they are the, the, the principal recipient. And they understand. And it. they need to understand everything mm -hmm. uh, that comes from the ministry. So, in other words, the ministry gives the Treasury unit technical backup. Okay. okay. Now, having understood that foundation, and if we bring it to this current conversation of the global fund and the procurement of these nets in this particular program for prevention, right? Now, there are some acronyms. Wagari, well, help us. What was it again? PD. P PBO. PBO. That was the type of thing. <laughs> 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 and mm. then there was the other one, the word pyrethrin. Pyrethrin. That's from pyrethrin, so it's easy to say. Exactly. The other one is perinibutane oxide or something. Exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say. Now, there was an issue when it came to these nets 
according to the Global Fund, mm. right? That there were certain standard requirements that they f there was an agreement. It was already pre-agreed that in the procure procurement of these nets, it was going to be the pri. Can, 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 I, can I cut you short? Yes. Mm. Yes. I will cut you short because sometimes we have struggled with that issue mm. of uh, specifications mm. and forgotten the reason why the nets are not being done in Kenya. Okay, so they're they not this, being uh, manufactured. They're not being the specifications have nothing. So are you saying the two are not related? Because the way in which it has come to us is that the, the two are related, or, which is what I was trying to establish. Or there's an order. The, the reason why this tender was cancelled, mm -hmm. Global Fund said uh, cancel, was because of inconsistencies in, pro in the processing of the tender, which is the tender evaluation. Okay. Had nothing to do with the specifications. Mm. So why has that Be come up? Y you see, and I'll tell you, I'll give you the chronology. Okay. So, mm. uh, okay. I don't know how long I have. Please go ahead. The reason why this tender was cancelled, Ed... PBO and no PBO not been there because once we gave this generic document, which is the policy document, which says if you want to buy nets for Kenya, mm -hmm. you can buy. And I, I, I think I carried a document which carries all these things. Mm. You can buy. There are so many specifications in terms of the fiber. You can buy poly, polyester or polyethylene. Mm. Uh, in terms of the shape, you can buy rectangular or conical. There are choices. In terms of color, you can buy uh, blue in, or green, light blue, white mm. or light green. Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, uh, <coughs> the, the, the active the, ingredients, the, the active ingredient for technology for 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 more insecticide or technology, mm. you can buy pyrethrine or PBO. 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 Mm. So once uh, any funder is given these specifications, they choose what they yeah. can buy. Okay. In this case, between National Treasury and KEMSA, who are developing the tender document, remember the ministry is not in this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Between KEMSA and the, uh, and and the National, National Treasury, Treasury and, 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 Global, and Fund, Global Fund, they agreed that we will go With for pyrethrine, pyrethrine mm -hmm. okay. not PBO. Mm -hmm. We will go for rectangular mm -hmm. and not uh, conical. Which is okay. We will go for, for light blue, mm. uh, uh, light, light blue and, and not, not white or mm. green. Oh. So those are now conversations between the procuring agency, agency which prepares the tender right. and the National Treasury and the Global Fund. And this is what happens all the time. And this is what happens. If I, if you look at the specifications mm. that were used, were sent to, and I have them mm. here, mm. which were sent to National Treasury again in 2020, word for word. Was same, like, same. Same, same, word for mm. word. The difference is, uh, this one is signed by Dr. Uh, Wako, uh, who was the head of malaria program then, and this one is signed by Dr. Omar, who was the head of malaria program. Word for word, because right. these are police documents. But now, the same document is given to other, because I always said there are other players mm. or funders mm. who support. Uh, so USAID are given the same, same, same document. Mm. And like in the last campaign, USAID chose the PBO. Because why? PBO has longer lasting insecticidal uh, effects. Okay. And, and therefore, it, uh, it, in terms of malaria, uh, mosquito repellency, it takes it's longer. Higher. Okay. So... And in the last campaign, Global Fund chose? Chose the same pyrethrin. Pyrethrin. Yes. So Global Fund in 2020 chose pyrethrin. And in, 20, in 2022, chose, in 2022 they chose mm. pyrethrin again. So, so my understanding, again. even from reading the thing, um, if, if you said, you know, it's, it's an issue between the Global Fund, Treasury, and, and KEMSA. But from what I understand, I think, I, I think it was someone in the ministry, I forget who it was, then looked at the tender and said, no, it's not correct. We need to change. Th that's why we have to, to go with a chronology. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm trying to understand because you yes. said it's only those three. So where, did, so where at, does the ministry the point, come in? Mm -hmm. This conversation is happening. There is no tender that's being floated. These mm -hmm. are technical conversations that mm -hmm. are happening, preparing for the tender. Okay. Once Global Fund, because the Global Fund reviewed the and uh, some of the information, I call it privileged information because I'm in Kemsa. Mm. Uh, after the uh, Global Fund reviewed the, 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 f the, the specifications, then they settled on this 
and the the Kemsa developer tender document was reviewed by Global Fund and Global Fund said okay we are okay to go we are okay to go and the spec the spec here was the specification now is by three mm -hmm. and light blue and light blue and, and rectangular. rectangular and all those things okay and these are doctors in treasury who have decided so we are clear with yes. technical competence yes. it's good yes yes okay and now mm. after that a tender is advertised in the newspapers a tender can't be advertised until this agreement is arrived at. no 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 mm. okay is advertised all right specs everything is put up in the newspapers and in the website bida start applying no more procurement process uh, bida pre, uh, pre mm. uh, was it a pre, pre qualified something list. conference mm -hmm. that they no they they there is a con conference that, that calls prospective yeah. bidders okay. to come and, and ask, ask questions, questions yeah. and all those things yeah. Yeah. happen then come on the 20 20th the tender is supposed to close i think on the 23rd mm. of february or thereabout maybe 20 second i cannot remember very well i do not have the fine details but around that day the, the head of malaria program comes to me and tells me daktari we the tender that was advertised does not have uh, a specification that we had put in the in the in in in, the, in our initial in our uh, request him from a technical point he thought we need to advertise both pbo and, and pyrethrin so that whichever is cheaper mm. carries the day carries the day right so i tell him doctor first this was my first mass net so i i have not done this before so mm. i told him okay and you are convinced this is okay he tells me it's okay then i tell him then you have explained to me your issue go put it in writing uh, bring it to me i process it uh, so that i escalate it or otherwise yeah uh, to the ps that is the tender is supposed to close in two days mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i he never comes back to me i don't see any communication from him then the following day i think on the 22nd or thereabout in the newspapers the tender has been extended to uh, to accommodate consultation or to address issues that have been raised by the ps I have to say that these are the same fairly, issues fairly that the told government. me about okay the next day that was high efficiency i must say so, <laughs> very fast for government that is very fast for government so so did you receive the memo that you requested for no <clears throat> in fact to be honest i only saw that memo uh two weeks ago can i ask why you asked for it to be put in writing and requested a memo because, because that's how government works mm -hmm. that uh, we come we have our discussions our niceties you tell me your opinion you go put it in writing mm -hmm. so that i act on it in writing okay. because any other thing what is not documented is it doesn't, doesn't exist happen. doesn't exist <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. so i asked him to do it in writing and he did it in writing and unfortunately i never saw it and somehow the ps saw it and acted on it and wrote to kemsa and within uh, two days kemsa had already extended the time and what's the procedure the procedure should pass through you N not directly even he should write to his immediate supervisor who is the head of department mm, then the head of writing. department writes to me and that didn't happen didn't happen okay so uh, whether it was deliberate i don't know okay whether it was a uh, oversight? A an oversight i don't know you, i don't want to imagine were you in the office that day too i was in the office so then and even when I'm not in you. the office mm. okay. usually there is someone acting in the office okay. and uh, they have mandate to review documents uh, sign documents and uh, was the memo addressed to you the memo was addressed to me it's to your attention yes to the attention of yes. the director yes. of, of medical, medical services for preventive and promotive health, health. and uh, the memo it's copied to it's, it was not copied to anyone it so was it's straight to me only to, to you me. but you never saw it it is here it's to me mm -hmm. through the head of uh, national mm -hmm. strategic public health program mm -hmm. from the head of malaria, head of malaria program that's, but that's also very interesting because in the way government processes if, if it reaches the a higher officer and the officer sees that the person who should go through hasn't signed yeah. they will send it back and say this that, person exactly. is that, that's why i said i don't want to imagine mm. uh, because there are many things that are happening out there mm. um, and if okay. it's not in your attention so it now so now explain to us before we take the break or let's take a break then yes. you can come and now take us through those exten the extension and then what happened thereafter okay, okay. and where 
ndawa ilivunjika Dr Andrew Mulwa is the acting CEO at the Kenya Medical Supplies Authority Prior to this he was the director of medical services in charge of promotive and preventive care at the Ministry of Health He's here explaining to us what has happened in this whole kerfuffle with the Kemsa and Global Fund and why he is having to answer so many tough questions before parliamentary investigating committees. Keep it here for more. This is Kenya's biggest conversation live on Spice FM on KTN Home and online. Wangari Moikia is here with us. She's our guest host today. She is an economist and the lead consultant with EGCL Institute. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. You have been saving and are now seeking a safe and secure investment for a profitable return. For an investment that is cushioned from inflation, calls 0719-034-550. With a deposit of as little as 250000 you can now start collecting rental income from your unit at Elmer Estate in Kasarani by Centum Real Estate. revs will you be ready to get all that petrol head enthusiasm at this year's annual digger motor show well you better belt up and make your way to kicc from the 20th to the 23rd of july 2023 for a wholesome four-day event come and join car lovers bike enthusiasts spare part dealers insurance as well as asset financers and more for what will be an unforgettable experience by far we are going all out to make it a great show for you and the whole family with something for everyone so you better not miss out for more information or participation contact caroline on 0723803601 partly cloudy in nairobi and we'll see 17 and cloudy in nakuru is 14 and cloudy in yeri and 15 and sunny conditions in eldoret at 24 mombasa is sunny and 25 sunny in malindi it's partly sunny at 21 in kisumu and sunny at 19 in kakamega the sun is up in kampala at 18 and 22 in dar es salaam Six and sunny in Johannesburg and mostly clear at 25 in Lagos, 21 and mostly cloudy in Kinshasa. It's that time again when we get to gather around and marvel at the great engineering, raw power, finesse and share in our round motor love for motoring at the annual Digger Motor Show 2023. From car lovers, bike enthusiasts, spare part dealers, insurance, as well as asset financers, and more, this year's Digger Motor Show will be one for the books. We're talking a whole four-day event from Thursday 20th to Sunday 23rd at KICC Grounds, Nairobi, where we will have something for everyone, so you better not miss out. Get the family, bring your friends, and share in the joys that will give you lasting memories and an experience you're bound to not forget. For more information or participation, contact Caroline on 0723-803601 or email sinyandiaka at standardmedia.co.ke. Digger Motor Show 2023 is brought to you by Standard Group and Digger Motors and is powered by Spice. Interchange touching on the Southern Bypass, not quite sure what's causing that. We have some coming off Lunga Lunga. So if you're on that Likoni Interchange trying to find out what's going on, uh, as you get onto the Southern Bypass, you'll be fine. There is some traffic on Langata Road that's coming in heavy towards Rilo Dingaway. Some of that will take it off there and then go towards Aerodrome. Gong Road is busy this morning and we're looking at traffic going well into Ayani Kibera and then trying to find its way to Gong Road. So that whole um, area is a beehive of activity. Looking much better coming off of Kiambu Road as well as the Thicker Super Highway. It's just heavy at that drift um, after survey. James Kishiro continues to be busy and we're looking at the whole Westlands area, bits and bobs of traffic here and there, but manageable. Liburu Road is not doing too badly this morning. Hopefully we can keep it just so. A little bit of traffic right around um, Gidurai coming in then towards Garden City. That still continues. Let's see what it looks like at around 9. Let us know. Spice of MKE on Twitter. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself.
Mornings done right. 94.4 Spice FM, Nairobi. The memo does not get to your office. It goes to and the And I don't PS. know that it exists. And you have no I, knowledge yes, of its existence. Exists. Yeah. But then the PS takes some action. And I don't know that she has taken And you action. have not heard of it. Yes. Okay. So what I only see this? it in newspapers. <laughs> I only see newspapers extending the ten. And how do I learn about it? I learn about it uh, from uh, Treasury asking why are you extending tender because they know I'm the technical advisor. And uh, Global Fund asking why, what is this? that I have no idea of. Mm. Then I learn that, uh, yeah, there's, there was a communication from the ministry okay. uh, that uh, there were some missing specifications in, as advertised by KEMSA. Right. Then uh, then the tender is extended, was it 14 days, I guess? Mm -hmm. Then uh, within that period, we have engagements with Treasury Global Fund. And I write another memo I ask, we, we have write another memo asking the PS uh, to affirm the specifications as advertised by KEMSA. Mm. And we forward that. Uh, I have not seen the action, whether it was acted on or not, uh, that uh, last memo that we did. Uh, but we did and forwarded the PS. So, and it's a, it's, a P, it's a prerogative of the PS to act just like anything coming from my juniors I have prerogative to make a decision mm. how to act on it neutral, no decision uh, reject, accept review, uh, you can do all sorts of things, mm. sometimes just, uh, call someone for discussion and, and all that, so I do not get any feedback on it so tender is closed uh, then Evaluations and I think around the same time I also send uh, nominate uh, through on advice from the program mm -hmm. technical officers to participate in the tender evaluation mm -hmm. because uh, the ministry uh, is the technical uh, part so we have to give people who understand uh, we give someone who understands uh, 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 HPTs mm -hmm. we give someone who understands entomology uh, disease and all those things mm -hmm. so people who have. Uh, 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 and a background mm. in, 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 in the sector. So we give uh, those ones and uh, the, the PS forwards. Same, of course, adds uh, an, an, an other persons. Adds right. for opening, adds a, an administrator, and for evaluations, adds a finance officer, mm. chief finance officer. So uh, that is the prerogative of the PS. Right. Because I propose the names, mm. she can, she or she can take in all of them. Or remove all of them and nominate new, uh, uh, new people. That's that's the, uh, that's so the job of the PS. That's, that's the job of the PS. Mm. Uh, so, and evaluation is done. Evaluation is complete. Uh, Pre-award review, because usually all global fund procurements uh, have to go through pre-award review. After you do the procurement. Uh, documents are sent to Global Fund for them to review and see. And this is a, is, is, is a risk management uh, uh, st step. Mm. So that rather than come at the end and say the procurement of these nets was uh, in, um, in, in, in improper, improper and therefore the country has to, uh, because if mm. there is uh, an impropriation uh, of Global Fund funds or ineligible expenditures, uh, lead to refund mm. rather than come back and say Kenya refund this money mm. uh, because the procurement that you did on the net uh, was bankrupt or didn't, uh, had problems uh, they review mm. so that they tell you okay we have reviewed at the process it's okay continue mm. we have reviewed at the process you need to work on one two three mm. uh, we have reviewed the process sometimes they say a lot of times actually they say go ahead mm. and uh, award to the to the winning bidders as, as proposed mm. Then uh, they give a, a report. What are their findings? One, they find there is inconsistencies in uh, in evaluation criteria. Mm -hmm. That out of the, I think the seventeen bids, uh, some bids the bidders had not uh, paginated or which is, which is mm -hmm. consistently paginated uh, their document because what, which was a requirement mm -hmm. before technical evaluation. Then some bids that. Had won, mm. had not done. So bids, some bidders were thrown out on account of no pagination. 
but some uh, some bidder who had not paginated as well proceeds but proceeded to the next stage to the next stage and so that the same an inconsistency okay then the other inconsistency is uh, bidders were supposed to have letters of authorization from manufacturers but one bidder who was a manufacturer themselves was told that they have not attached <laughs> letter of authorization, letter of authorization from, from themselves from themselves <laughs> <laughs> so i mean uh, number three mm. one because the bidders were also supposed to give samples one bidder brings a sample from a company in holland mm -hmm. but the letter of authorization is from a company in dubai mm -hmm. which are not related oh okay mm -hmm. And uh, apparently, they proceeded. And these ones have proceeded to, to. When you say they're not related, what does that I mean? I mean, uh, you know, when you are tendering, mm. and you, well, the reason you get letter of authorization from manufacturer is that manufacturer commits that they will man make this product for you for that tender. Mm. Uh, uh, with uh, those specifications. With those specifications. Yes. So when you go to uh, your BD to deliver softer, mm. then you deliver cock for mm. sample mm. and problem. you have a letter of authorization from softer but the sample is from coca-cola yeah. there's a problem it's a problem but when you uh. say it's passing it's uh. from the technical the procurement committee that was the appointed technical evaluation those are committee. the people yes. who have evaluated yes, evaluated. yes. okay so global fund says here we have found inconsistencies and for that reason you cannot proceed mm. so this tender should be redone under normal circumstances should be redone but Global Fund, because this current grant is running from 2021 July to 2024 uh, uh, July, mm -hmm. June 30th. Mm -hmm. After that, it closes and funds are not available. Mm -hmm. This mass net has to be done in this financial year. If we are to repeat the same process, it would cross over. It would, it would mean the nets are earliest here in December or January. Mm -hmm. Then to distribute nets in 27 counties would mean spillover. Uh, to the next financial, which would mean Kenya would have lost the, the money and mm. opportunity. So they advise, uh, in the interest of time, let's use Wamba. Let's get somebody else. Let's get somebody else because they have their own project. And Kenya is among the only four counties, four countries rather. Mm. I've worked in the counties a lot longer. Uh, four countries that had been given the opportunity to procure for mm. themselves the nets. Mm. Okay. Uh, so these Wamba guys uh, who, they, are, yeah, they who are, are then selected, yeah. do they advertise for tenders? They have, uh, they, they are a global fund uh, procuring agency. Just like KEMSA. Just like KEMSA. Mm -hmm. Right. And they have pre-qualifications. They have uh, people, bidders who already have priced mm -hmm. right. their products. Mm -hmm. So them, they just call down. Mm -hmm. So if it's net, global fund will do a call down and say, uh, because they already have their prices mm -hmm. already. So they did not, when they were selected, they did not go through a bidding process, a mm -hmm. procurement process. The, 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 the Wambo. Yeah. The, their procurement process is done in the background so they have so maybe they like, they're like frameworks mm. okay. i would say they are frameworks mm. with the manufacturers mm. and okay yeah they they were were probably able approved to deploy yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. i've got a question here mm. now according to executive order number one of 2023 the organization of the ministry of health has two state departments the state department for medical services the state department for public health and professional standards you as the director of medical services you are under a, a director of preventive and promotive health services you are under the state department for public health and professional standards no is that not so? let, let me tell you the most difficult assignment that i ever did in my life was mm. between uh, december and april because what? i was reporting to two pss some of my functions mm. were on medical mm. services and other functions Wow, wow, in preventive. Uh, preventive mm -hmm. uh, and uh, wow, on uh, public health and mm -hmm. professional standards. Mm -hmm. So I was reporting to two PSs. Having two bosses, two instructions, you're supposed to be here, so, uh, it was not easy for so me. So you were under two state departments? Yes, I was across because the, how the functions, my functions were organized, mm -hmm. I had the National Strategic Public Health pro Programs, HIV, TB, Malaria, Immunization. Uh, TB and malaria were in public health. Mm -hmm. HIV and and immunization were in medical, medical services. Reproductive health, uh, 
uh, not what we used to call family health mm. uh, department are the reproductive maternal uh, child reproductive health neonatal adolescent all those who are in medical services mm -hmm. but there was nutrition also which was also in public health i also had another department uh, uh, of ncd uh, mm. which i think ncd was purely under under medical services except some tussle on the tobacco control mm. which was uh, crossing over the other side mm. then i also had a, a community a department of uh, primary primary health care uh, services okay. which had uh, community health services on one side and uh, primary health care on the other side so reporting so in this particular matter then of global fund at the initial stages when you were working on the work plan and the development plan and forwarding them to the PS so that the PS that time forwards. was one PS was before it was before, before this, this organization to st mm. uh, state departments at this stage when the head of malaria control is coming to you and you advise him to send you malaria is under public health and is under ma so which PS acted on uh, the PS uh, public health and for public health standards. in fact for for purposes of programs because programs work uh, with 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 the line ps for mm. malaria was public health even though kemsa as an organization is under is under medical, medical services, services. Mm -hmm. for purposes of this the ps medical services was not in the picture because okay. kemsa malaria is doing health, yeah. agency program. work mm -hmm. is doing agency work is okay. not doing policy or, or, or professional work is doing and agency, agency work. work falls under uh, well, under public, public health, public public health. health. yes okay. so the ps was all right Yes. in taking the action yes assuming that it had followed the chain yes basically forwarding this to the kemsa boss was under the pss purview then. yes yes even um, advising who the members of the technical evaluation committee would be mm -hmm. forwarded from the ministry it's still okay it's still okay for still the okay. ps then yes. to do that yes so there's nothing wrong about you know she mm -hmm. did not no. overreach into the no, mandate no, no. of no, the no, state no, department no, for health no. because uh, for example uh, Kemsa serves other organizations. Kemsa mm -hmm. serves uh, Kemsa, not Kemsa, uh, AMREF. Mm -hmm. Kemsa serves Red Cross. Mm -hmm. Kemsa serves National Treasury. Kemsa serves KNH. Kemsa serves many other organizations. Mm -hmm. So Kemsa is the doing counties. agency work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So uh, sometimes uh, KNH or Kenyatta University Teacher and Referral Hospital will write to Kemsa mm -hmm. and tell Kemsa, procure for us this theater equipment okay in your understanding dr Terry, why then would this committee that you sat before last week place the blame of the loss of this tender squarely at your feet did they yes they did i thought they there was were a quote in the paper and they said that you are the reason why kenya then has lost this tender i thought what they were asking our questions mm. They haven't done a report yet. They are asking questions. Okay, so why Just would like, they ask like, that? Why would they not blame you then for because, the loss of this because tender? Because they want to get it to understand with clarity. Just like you're asking me questions mm. here. Mm -hmm. You would not understand. If you don't ask the questions, you would not under, uh, uh, have an in-depth understanding of the mm. issues. So, I, and I, I feel and I appreciate the, mm. uh, both uh, the National Assembly and the Parliamentary Committee. Mm. Because this gives an opportunity for Kenyans to know the truth. Sure. And you see, uh, and even here, and I'm not trying to play innocent or to justify innocence on anyone. Mm. I'm just stating facts as they are. So that now, as I, as after I share the information that I have, mm. it's upon the committee to look at the information that they have gotten from me, the evidences that I've supplied them, and make a decision. The fact is, uh, the, the committees are doing their work. And that is what oversight is all about. And uh, there's a difference, by the way, mm. between uh, committee work, because like uh, last week, I think we sat on the committee for about three hours. Mm. Uh, the, the news will report for five minutes. Mm. So you can't <laughs> capture what was spoken mm. in two hours and five mm. minutes. <laughs> uh, papers, you can't capture what has been... Uh, can't capture the spirit of what was happening. Yes. There. Uh, so... And the, the hard questions have to be asked. Mm -hmm. And we must have answers for them. And whoever is capable should take the, 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 the responsibility. Then can I ask you, Dr. Ari, what would have been your response? Because all of this 
I mean, you say that it doesn't have anything to do with said memo or who, what specifications, because those were already arranged. What would have been your response had the memo that you requested to be put in writing, had that actually come to your desk? How would this have changed the flow of things from what we see today? First, two things would have happened. Mm. I would have consulted the National Treasury because I knew they were processing. I would have called KEMSA and ask them what is the basis of your act of, of this tender why did you have this removed i would have called the global fund because we are in touch with the global fund uh, in geneva so in other words first thing is consult then form an opinion and advise appropriately so i mean that is and in my course of duty there are so many things that come to my that have come to my desk and after consulting the relevant organs or mm. organizations i advise the officers this opinion this advice that you have given me is irrelevant in this context mm. this advice uh, cannot be taken in because of abcd so it is through and that's why i think uh, managers are in office you are in office to make sure that you have you and that's why government is layered so that the technical person may have this persuasion this is not then when the, you, it comes to you you mm. do the wide sector level consultations then you are guided and you take action, and you take action. Mm. now you are the ceo at kemsa supposing a similar instruction comes to you from the principal secretary what would you do i think if i were the ceo you then are. no okay, no <laughs> then, on this particular matter mm -hmm. before extension mm. i would have consulted with the global fund okay. and uh, treasury which she did in writing mm -hmm. but sometimes a call away I have received this instruction mm -hmm. and uh, what am I supposed to do? Uh, because you know the process, you, what has happened. Then, because when she wrote, after three days, w after the extension had already been done, mm -hmm. she already, uh, was it actually after three days mm -hmm. or two days? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She already had an answer which said Global Fund have already committed to the specs. Mm -hmm. sure. So if she had consulted, a telephone now, and we know, this pe we know all these people. You have their contact. You know the Global Fund Coordinator in the National Treasury. Right. Call him. Ask him. I have received this letter from the PS. Mm. What should I do? Mm. That's what I would have done. Mm -hmm. Just a call. I have received this. So this particular time, you are the CEO at yes. Kemsa. All right? And there's a possibility of such instructions coming from the ministry coming to your desk. It, and they are time bound. Because I look this at... This is an instruction coming from your boss, <laughs> the principal secretary in the Ministry of Health. Are you going to say, no, 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 I have got to ask other people before I act on the instructions for my superiors? If I look at the, 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 the letter that the PS wrote, the letter had asked for rectification of an error. So th two things. Is there an error? That's the first thing. Before you, you worked, you have to establish whether there is an error. Right. So if that's the first thing that you need to do, establish, I would establish, is there an error? If there is no error, I write to the PS and, tell, uh, and inform her that uh, I have reviewed, consulted, and I found that the, it is not an error. It was deliberate and designed to be advertised that way. So there is nothing missing as per our advert. Finish. Okay. The other question that we asked the, your board chairman who was here three weeks ago, was it two weeks ago? Mm -hmm. So you are not an appointee of the board as Dr. Andrew Mulo. Uh, do you report to the board? I report to the board. Or do you report to another, to your appointing authority who is not the board? Let me tell you. <laughs> Government is a funny animal. I am an employee of the board. From the 16th, 17th rather, of is May. That a, is that a transfer of services? Uh, Can you go back to the ministry? If my tenure is done, but for the time being, mm. I have an appointment from the board. And so who pays your salary? KEMSA. Mm. Okay. So if I applied for a job at KEMSA. Who signed your appointment letter? Mm. Chair of the board. Mm. But you were appointed on the same day? No. You know, that is... Uh, <laughs> my, my appointment <laughs> had to be regularized oh. by the board. Because, you know, there is the strict... KEMSA is a semi-autonomous government agency. Mm. Uh, my name was, uh, was, was proposed... Pub publicly announced. announced mm. But the board had to sit down 
and make the decision over it okay. over it mm -hmm. deliberate and give me a minute then give me an appointment letter so i am acting on appointment of the board maybe the proposition who proposed my name is a question but that's how government works Can that uh, mm -hmm. there is a bureaucracy uh, sometimes looks straightforward but is not as straightforward can I ask a follow-up question that uh, is bothering me, but uh, it, it, I just need to understand. If the challenge around the procurement was the evaluation, and the evaluation was done by the, these people who are selected, but you selected the, these people, so how, do you, how does that play in, into to your responsibility because these people who mis-evaluated are your, the people you proposed? I mean... People take responsibility for their own actions. I did not. I was not part. I was not part of the. I did not even know when they did the evaluation, where they were seated, who they were with. Uh, so, and they are technical people. So that one, they take individual responsibility mm -hmm. on that because uh, being nominated, I am the CEO for Kemsa. When I do something wrong, I take personal responsibility. Mm. So it is, and I'm not saying they did something wrong. Whatever they did, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, they took. They have to take mm. personal responsibility. It doesn't matter uh, because I would have nominated any other person. Mm. I, no I nominated them on the strength of their technical capacity. You knew them from before. If they've done this work before. I, I nominated them on the account of their technical capacity. Mm. A procurement person, an entomologist, and uh, an HPT specialist. So I was basing my... We've been placed there by the Public Service yes. Commission, which has evaluated yes. there. Okay. okay. Dr. Mulwa, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. It's not been a hot seat. So you'll come now, we talk about KEMSA. N and, and that is actually what I thought I'm coming to talk <laughs> about. Yes. Uh, I'm surprised <laughs> I've spent all this time talking about but NET. But very and, enlightening. Uh, and, 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 it's important. And, yes. Mm. But so you'll uh, come and tell us what you're doing with KEMSA. We have to fix KEMSA because KEMSA... Mm -hmm. is important for the people of Kenya. Mm -hmm. It is. Dr. Andrew Muloa, Acting CEO, Kenya Medical Supplies Authority. Keep it here for more. 9 a.m. Spice up your life. Good morning, this is the Newswire. I'm Lea Obaga. Police say that Azimio Laomoja Coalition is free to hold the consultative meeting in Nairobi. County Police Boss Adamson Bungay says the coalition had notified them of the planned meeting at Kamkunji, Kamkunji Grounds in Mudurua area. County Bungay further said that the police had made arrangements to ensure the meeting is peaceful and a success. This event comes as dozens of police officers have already been deployed in the CBD and at the venue ahead of the meeting. Azimio leader Ryan Laudenga is expected to arrive in the country from Poland today in order to lead the People's Baraza that's set to take place at Kamkunji Grounds. Azimio leaders had urged police to provide them with security, something that has already been done as they said they are going to march from JKIA all the way to Kamkunji grounds for their meeting. The meeting is aimed at discussing strategies that will be used to oppose the already signed into law 2023 finance bill. Two men have died after falling into a borehole at a village in Bongoma County. Area Chief Geoffrey Wamalua says one of the men fell while fetching water while the other fell inside the borehole as he tried to rescue his friends. He says that rescue operations are underway. Trade Cabinet Secretary Moses Kuria has announced the way forward amidst his fight with the media. Kuria said he wakes up early every day to do work that will fix the country's economy, but that is not highlighted by the media. In a tweet, the CS insisted that he'll continue working hard to turn around the economy, whether the media reports it or not. He added that he will continue to say the things that will make the press give him coverage. Kuria has been on the news in the past few days over his attacks on the nation media group. The attacks began on Sunday when during a church gathering, Kuria said he would suck any government official who advertises with the media house. A herd of elephants have attacked and killed a man in a village in Narrow County. This happened as the victim and other villagers tried to chase the animals from a maize plantation in the area. The body of the deceased was found outside his house long after the animals had trampled on him in Mulot area. The deceased was in the company of other villagers and had spotted a herd of about... 
15 ele elephants destroying the maize plantation. The animals rain towards the nearby Masai Mara National Park amid screams from the locals. And CIA Deputy Governor William Odol has said that he intends to seek the help of elders and churches to reconcile him with his boss, Governor James Sorengo. This is after he survived impeachment after a majority of senators voted against the bid to remove him from office. 27 senators voted against the two grounds that the Senate Special Committee probing his impeachment by the Sierra County Assembly had found to have been proven as substantiated. I'm extremely excited and uh, first I want to thank God for uh, this uh, victory and uh, importantly I equally want to thank the Senate for uh, the very fair impartial deliberations that I have had at the Senate and um, I want to assure the people of Sierra that our primary calling is service to them and uh, that I'm looking forward to going back to Sierra to join Governor James Orango in uh, providing effective and efficient service to the people of Sierra County. I want to use both in person and I also hope to use elders and churches to help us bridge this divide. However, CIMC has blamed the Kenya Kwanzaa team for playing politics in the matter that affected residents of their county. We have confirmed, we have been vindicated here, that there is a breakage of law. The deputy governor has contravened the constitution, so them working with Orang, is it going to rectify the constitutional breach? The special committee of the Senate found the deputy governor to be culpable. What has played out in the Senate in the debate which was going on was the political game between Azimio and Kenya Kwanzaa. And it's good, we now know we as here is an ODM government. The Departmental Committee on Health will today meet with Health CS New Susan Nahumicha and top management of the NHIF. The meetup will see them discuss, among other issues, the non remittance of NHIF capitations to hospitals, providing services to cardholders, review of cash flow statements for the past two years, and assessment of any existing financial reserve policies. Nahumicha and other officials will also be tasked with expressing concerns regarding hospitals' refusal to accept NHIF cards and the recent cancellation of NHIF recruitment for the CEO and senior management directors. That's the Newswire. I'm Lea Ubaga. Four point four Spice FM, Nairobi. Um, now at around nine o'clock, we're seeing traffic looking much better in most parts. I don't think we'll have a problem getting in and out of the city today. That issue that was on Likoni Road more or less has uh, been sorted out. We're just looking at some still on Gong Road getting into the city. It'll connect with what's coming off of Kamkunji at the roundabout, and then all meeting on Haile Selassie getting through to the city is CBD. Out then towards Westlands is probably where you have the most action right about now. Seems like we're going to end traffic hour early today. Still keep an eye on things through the morning. Let us know. Spice FM, KE on Twitter. This is the Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C. T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is the Situation Room, Colgate the only way to start your day. What to do, and this is how to help people who have no access to drinking water get safe access to drinking water. So what Colgate is doing is uh, running a campaign where they're raising funds, and with that, they're, all, they're working on building 30 water wells to provide water for over 150,000 people in various parts of the country. They've done this before. They're doing it again. Visit the Colgate-Palmolive Kenya Facebook page or you can go to their website www.colgate.ke slash our hyphen programs.
for more information. And the information will be that if you go to any Naivas supermarket today or you go to Naivas online platforms and shop and buy for every tube of Colgate that you buy, some of that money will go into this initiative. This is an initiative to get people smiling again because they have access to portable water. It's an important thing. Don't take these things for granted. There are people who actually don't have access to this water. Now, bring it down into children. Children who don't have access to drinking water. So, their school attendance is affected because many times those are the children who will be sent to go how many kilometers, City? It depends. It could go up to even 100. 100 kilometers? Well. In search of water? Yes. Yeah. Meaning you don't get it. Ordinarily, mm. 5, 10, 15 kilometers. And sometimes there's even no guarantee that there's water. Yeah. So their school attendance is affected because of this, because you are using the children to go and look for water, then the children come to school, then also everything else. It's not just about even safe drinking water, even water for just washing. And when that water is toilets. available, it's periodical. Mm. There are times it simply isn't mm -hmm. there. That's where the 100 kilometers comes in. So now what do you Where? do in the interim? Where? So the water that people use for everyday use is water that just one look at it and you suddenly feel unwell. Mm. And that's the water that they use every single day. Yeah. So let's do something about it. Now that we know that you're buying uh, your toothpaste, go and buy Colgate at Naivas specifically and you'll be helping toward this. Our next guest is in the studio. We want to talk about reparations for victims of torture. This is going to be a big one. Isabella Obara is the technical lead for litigation and legal advice at the Independent Medical Legal Unit. Good morning, Isabella. Good morning, Latif. Good to have you on the show again. Oh, I'm happy to be back. Welcome Thanks back to me. Kenya's biggest conversation. <laughs> Asante sana. We're talking about torture. Yes. Victims of torture. Right. And what they ought to get in terms of justice for exactly. them. Yeah. Reparations. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a big one. Let me introduce you to Wangare. Wagari Moikia is our guest host today. She's been here with us since 5 a.m. Mm -hmm. See okay. how energetic she still yes. looks? Good job. She can do <laughs> this thing. Analyzer, I've been surviving on mentors. Let me just tell you what happens behind the scenes. <laughs> <laughs> I see. I see. Yeah, so she's our guest host today. City, mm -hmm. the day is proverb. Yes, our proverbs for the whole of this week come from the country of Chad. Today's proverb, there is no such thing as a small fire or a small woman. There is no such thing as a small fire or a small woman. Isabella, you are the first female guest occupying that seat this morning. Perfect. Tell us your interpretation of this proverb. And, and before I say, let, let me throw another one. Uh, because when I was here last, there was something that said, City, I have one that has been very interesting and would be useful for us in this discussion. Right. It's a West African proverb. And they say, when a woman is running and they hold their breasts, it's not because they'll fall. It's because of beauty. Okay. Hey. Mm. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? No, you may know. Again. <laughs> when a woman is running and they hold their breasts, yes. it's, no, it's not because they'll fall. Yes. Who, who will it's fall? because of beauty. It's not the because breasts. the woman will fall? No, it's not because the breasts will fall. Oh, it's not because the breasts will it's fall. because of beauty. So okay. we'll juggle that as we go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now back to the <laughs> <laughs> City, I question that. Oops. Come back here, City. Come back Join here. us. Come back, come back here. Back. Where do you think I've gone? <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, this sort of today, what's your interpretation of it? No well, small thing as a fire or a small woman. Well, and, and I'll take a rough stab at it because I was heavily invested in mine, but my thinking is um, <laughs> every. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had to be very um, selfish. But my thing is, I feel like, and I look at it from the human rights perspective, it's just that everyone has a role to play in this particular race. Everyone has something to give. You could be a content creator, you could be a security officer, a procurement officer, a lawyer, because the way we've looked at issues around torture is um, you have to be a lawyer or a medical practitioner or a pathologist who can document um, deaths. No. If there's no such thing as small, maybe a fire or a woman or whatever it is the city has said, my, my thinking, my very rough interpretation is that there's nothing small in this particular fight. Everyone has something to give. That's just how I look at it for now. Okay. That's a good one. Really? Mm. That's a good one. 
Thank Our you. position with proverbs and the interpretations thereof mm-hmm. is that your, interpre- your interpretation is always correct. Perfect. Because it is your interpretation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and, and from my context and what we do every day, mm. I have gone around just saying, hey, if you work around um, data, there's something you can do for human rights. If you are a clinician, there's something you can do. If you're a nutritionist, there's something you can do. It's not just legal work. Mm. Truly, um, it's not legal work, and we need to move from that particular space. And that's what I see from what City has just said. Great. Yeah. Now, victims of torture. First question: Is there an official universal definition of torture? Yes, there and is. What is it? Okay, so based on the Convention Against Torture, Article One, we pick it with four ingredients. Yeah, so it's not the usual latif. Uh, oh my God, I'm I'm broke. I'm so tortured. Mm-mm. In the legal space, what we say is first thing, it has to be um, intentional infliction of pain, whether physical or mental. Mm -hmm. That's the first one. And then by a public officer, and this one we'll discuss at a later point, Mm -hmm. that's a public officer in their official capacity. Okay, not as your spouse. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. That's where we go wrong. But I'll tell you something else on that. Mm. In the official capacity, with intent... And in a given, maybe intensity. They also talk about intensity, Mm -hmm. but with intent. Are you trying to get information? Are you trying to deter someone from accessing justice? There's normally some intention. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you're trying to subdue, you know, maybe you're Mm -hmm. arresting someone. So we have four ingredients. Um, Intentional intentional infliction of pain. Or or physical. Physical or mental. Or emotional. And then by a public officer in their official capacity mm-hmm. with intent mm. to a certain intensity. Okay. But you'll notice that there are certain countries who've moved forward to now remove the aspect of public officer because they argue that um, there are certain heinous crimes that need not be in that particular space only. Um, we have Armenia, we have Montenegro, we have, uh, I think, Queensland State in Australia. But Kenya as is, we must have that ingredient of a public officer, especially in the official capacity. Okay. Mm-hmm. So th- that's generally the definition. Mm-hmm. Public yeah. officer? Yes. Is it the same as a public defender? No. <laughs> so a public officer is someone who's being paid from the public coffers. So you have to be a state officer. And every time we discuss this, we keep thinking, um, maybe it's just a police officer. No, you don't have to be a police officer to be a public officer. Mm. So right? anybody who is paid by the public yes. is a public officer. Right. Right. Not all state officers are public officers. Well, not, not all public officers are state, state officers. officers. Yes. But all state officers are public officers. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, anybody who works. Are we mixing that up? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think he, I think he is correct. No, all state you officers are, are public officers. Yes, but not yes, all but public not officers. Are state, state officers. officers. Yeah. Yes, yeah, civil servants. I think yeah. So yeah. Everybody who is paid by whatever, whether Every it's somebody person. who is employed as a security pass uh, officer, as a teacher, yes. as a police officer, as a judge. Yeah. Yes. Latif, let me give you the best example. Okay. You have a chief. So we normally go to Mashinani. Yes. Um, two weeks ago, Imlu was in Isabania trying to document um, cases of uh, police violation during Mandaman. I think you remember. Yes. Uh, a few people were shot dead. And so you have chiefs. Yeah. And, and in those spaces, chiefs are very revered and respected and they're very, you know, powerful. Yeah. And so they have these small boys who work with them. So they go around in a pro box. So it could be their cousin, younger brother, who they can just say, go, go to Latif's house and raid the pombe he has in that space. Mm-hmm. Uh, when they do that, they also become... A, just pause for a second. Young men, when you say small boys... I'm thinking of 11-year-olds <laughs> and 12-year-olds. Well, yes, young yes. men. Ordinarily, it's young men. Obviously, they're, they're people of legal age, all right? Okay. But they're young Car- men, yeah. Carry on. Okay. Yes. Um, and so when they work with them, they also become public officers because they're working under the acquiescence of the state. And I've spoken about this before because you're under instruction of a public officer. But are they paid? No, now, that's why I told you there's an extra layer of complexity in this particular discussion. Mm. Because if you're being instructed by a, by a pub- person who's a public officer, especially in the official capacity, you'll be also a person who can be charged for oh, torture. Okay. Because you're under instruction, right? Okay. So the payment aspect now, the payment aspect is something that just helps us to understand who a public officer is. Mm. But if they can instruct, mm. right, mm. Then, then indeed it, it, it we presume that possibly this person is paying you this benefit or interest. Hmm. Yeah. Is this the so law? 
It is the law. It is the law. It is the law. Is it the same law which now, if you happen to be caught with an item that is known to have been stolen, then you are better off having stolen the item than having been somebody who is actually found with a stolen item. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same sort of law. It's the same. Well, look. So What's the thinking behind it? I just want to understand. <laughs> the, the thinking behind it mm. is this person is in a space of power, mm. right? And for you, you're trained to ensure that... So you have positive and legal obligation to ensure the security of a person. Mm. So we presume that you have the capacity and the tools to make sure that this person is safe. And if that particular training does not remind you or restrain you from instructing people in a certain way, then we will hold you to account and then we hold the person you're instructing to account. That's where the issue of command responsibility comes from. Right. So, so, so to answer you, what you're talking about is aiding and abating if you're hiding or you're transporting. That's a different subject, but the same thinking. Mm, yeah. the so same what thinking. happens? Uh, okay, I think when I was thinking about this yesterday, I was like, okay, do they deal with things like shakahola? I guess not because <laughs> this torture, I guess it's uh, in, to some degree but he's not a public officer. I was thinking about Lamu, what happened with uh, the other day with uh, the beheadings and I was mm. like, okay, maybe that's not under your purview. But things like, what when you talked about Manda Mano, like we, the strikes, uh, I think it was, we were having every Tuesday and Thursday the strikes and then the officers are tear gassing people and, you know, uh, that, that kind of um, controlling of, 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 of protests, right? Mm. Is that considered? Because I imagine the public officers, the, the, the soldiers, Right, Police who are officers. under your, the purview that you're talking about, mm -hmm. uh, are controlling a crowd according to how they've been trained. But they can that be considered torture? Is that under your purview? Can someone come and say I was tear gassed? So there needs to be a case, <laughs> or and and then how does that also link up with the processes of the government in terms of of disciplining their own officers? How do you play in? It saddens me a great deal to discuss this because yeah, first of all, yes it falls under our purview because this is a national police service officer while well, doing crowd control. For us, we call crowd management crowd control, but they'll, they'll talk about public order and everything. But that being said, if you're protesting, right, is, is there a need for any use of excessive force? Is there a need? Just randomly, if I, if I may ask, is there a need for any use of excessive force? Mm. I'm not and sure. it, the general rule of the get out of hand, right? What is out of hand? You see, when we define, so we've now moved to public protest. Mm -hmm. So we've we've digressed, but that's fine. So when we're looking at issues of protest, who who is a, how do we define a peaceful protester in Kenya? Mm -hmm. There's no proper definition. All we say is that you should should be peaceful and unarmed. What the hell is that? Mm -hmm. What the hell is that? So mm. if, if I'm raising maybe a carton box written something or maybe I'm shouting, does that mean I'm armed? And you see, the general rule of the thumb is that you should not use force at any point mm -hmm. while managing a crowd. Mm -hmm. That's just the general rule. So in the event that this person is armed, maybe throwing stones or maybe, um, maybe causing danger or posing danger to yourself as an officer or to the public or to property then there's some force you can use but still not excessive force mm -hmm. the public order act has several guidelines in which you can maybe de-escalate a situation yeah so by the time you're shooting in the air to kill or maybe you're just shooting randomly have you followed all these other uh, procedures in the standard operating procedures while managing a crowd mm -hmm. uh, my answer would be no we were in isebania i'll have you know that and we went right to the point where the late Johanna was shot. Mm. He was a guitarist mm. leaving service. He was shot not knowing where people were mm. doing the mandamano. He just got caught into it. The, the funny thing or um, something that should hunt us as Kenyans continuously is that we have allowed or we have been very okay with other people being shot, not knowing that you and I can even get shot in traffic. Mm -hmm. Right. So the question, or rather for us, what is important with, uh, with the kind of work that we do is that at no particular point should there be use of excessive force. Mm -hmm. So, And I'll have you know that once we complete documentation in Isabania, in Kisumu, in Nairobi, we're going to proceed to court. So the first steps that we're taking is to undertake legal documentation as enshrined in the Istanbul Protocol uh, 2022, the new edition. And what that does it, is that it captures both mental and physical harms cost 
during protests yeah so once we're done with that we'll write to the inspector general and say hey we had a few of your officers in this place could we have their names mm -hmm. just to request him for information uh, certainly they may respond sometimes they may not respond but that's fine what you're trying to do is we're giving the state agencies the responsible state agencies a chance to respond and support because the practice has always been when we're looking or working with victims of torture as CSO sometimes we tend to think we can work in silos it yeah. doesn't work mm -hmm. the state in itself is the one that will be offering reparations that we're going to talk about here. Mm -hmm. So we'll write to them. If they don't respond, we'll proceed to court. But all I'm saying is it, it, to just wrap this up. Again, it should haunt us the way in which we handle crowds because it could be me walking to buy airtime down my, uh, in my flat and there's a trigger happy officer just shooting in the, in the, in the air mm. simply because you want to scare people. And I hate that we do that because the public order is what we used during the you know, pre- or post-colonial period. And you'll notice that the people we copy-pasted this particular law from have already moved, they've since moved. For us, we have gone through different cycles of, of you know, public protest and lobbying and picketing, but we still use that very old act. There have been several attempts to change it, but nothing has changed. Why do we have a small elite group, group of police officers working the way they did post uh, pre mm. or post colonial like are we dealing with people who are just black because the way it was it was <laughs> white mm. against black yeah. and black is bad mm. rowdy confused mm -hmm. uneducated that's not i mean now we are kenyans we are educated <coughs> we have the tools we know things we need to move from public order okay to to crowd management. Yeah. And so when, when you're when you when you're putting someone or your I don't know what the word is, um uh, convict I don't know what the word is, when you when you when you get someone who has undertaken this, it's that person who is uh, who is under who's being who's going to be facing the charges and not their superior. Okay. I, I like that question. I'll tell you why. Um when we are looking at issues of, of, of these particular acts around torture, there are two, two facets. The first one being issues of command responsibility. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know how a service works. Mm -hmm. It's yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And Even I can give you an order. The chief sends yeah. a young man. Now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, so there's that aspect, mm -hmm. which we, we must talk about. And you'll see there are some live cases in court that have been solely founded on command responsibility. And so we're saying, because you are not giving us information as to who you had posted in Isabania to you. manage that crowd. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you come tell us in court. Mm -hmm. so Command responsibility, we mm -hmm. will hold you. And then also you'll notice in the National Police Service Act, there, there are certain sections of the law that indicate that if there's any death or injury, the person you, who has been assigned that task needs to come to you as the superior and yeah. report. Mm -hmm. And once they report, then you have to make a report to the Independent Policing Oversight Authority. As the, as the senior. Mm -hmm. And so some of these steps, when they are not followed, then we question you under command responsibility mm -hmm. because you know far too well mm -hmm. what had happened, but you didn't you do didn't anything. Mm -hmm. And then now there's that particular place where we lift that veil mm -hmm. of you being in service. Because, I mean, they're good cops. Mm -hmm. They are there. Mm -hmm. So we lift that veil and say, hey, now you as an officer were, are being investigated for one, two, three, and you will be charged. Mm -hmm in a criminal court, or even we could go um, maybe file a constitutional and human rights petition mm -hmm. and, and also have you as a person outside the office. We do respect the offices, mm -hmm. but when we have enough information and proper investigation reports, then you can also be charged as a person. Okay. I've got a, a, a question and maybe a couple of questions, and this is with regards now to what you've said. When you... Uh, 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 an organization such as IMLU yeah. goes to Isibania and it's conducting investigations on what is alleged torture that took place yeah. and you're documenting it for you to be able to take it to court you need to be able to prove that indeed torture happened in the way we've defined it intentional infliction of physical or emotional pain by a public officer in their official capacity with intent and to a certain intensity now how will you gather information that supports all this number one how do you actually document that there was infliction of emotional pain? Number two, you can get the public officer, yes. <laughs> but certain intensity, how do you gauge the intensity? Okay. Um, f first, let me say this, Latif. Justice looks very different. Very, very different from several people. So torture victims will tell you um, when you go to them, yeah, they'll tell you, you know, 
I now have my arm amputated from a gunshot, but all I need is for you to get me something I can do because now I've lost, you know, maybe mobility or whatever. This is all I want. I don't want to go to court. Another person will tell you, I actually want to go to court. I don't care how long it will take. I genuinely want to go to court. Mm. Another person will tell you, I simply want an apology. Right? Just an acknowledgement. Just an that acknowledgement. You did this to me. Yes. Mm -hmm. Another. So, because torture affects people in different ways. It could be a person. It could be a family. It could be a whole community. Yeah. Mm. So, a community will tell you, we simply want the truth. We, we don't want to know um, maybe how much you'd give us or what compensation. We don't want the millions. We just want the truth. Tell us what happened to our kin. And, and that's all the closure that we need. So once we, we, we know that, mm. you'll, you'll, you'll realize that um, going to court is just but a small facet of, of seeking reparations. But even with that being said, um, for us, we document based, like I said, um, on the Istanbul, Pro Istanbul Protocol. And the truth about uh, the current context is that it's very, it has, and it has been and it still is very hard to prove emotional distress as caused by torture. Mm. However, when we are doing our assessment, what we do is we have um, several officers going with us to the field. So we have a legal practitioner and we have a psychologist, we have a medical officer, and we also have someone who's a counselor because sometimes it gets very, very teary. So during that process, we will take witness statements. I mean, the usual legal stuff. Mm -hmm. So you'll take um, the bio data, the witness statements, maybe the victim statements and everything. The medical officer will do their thing. I mean, I'm not a medical officer. They'll do what they need to do. Once we have that, because we do not have that investigation muscle, we will do a petition to the Independent Policing Oversight Authority. Where appropriate, we'll also send it to the Internal Affairs Unit. And then they, they will do their bit. Especially this is to trigger the criminal prosecution. Right. Because you see... We, we don't prosecute, we simply watch brief, mm. right? So that's that. But in the civil space, what we normally do is we put together a nice bundle of documents. And this is, we don't want to get into a legal lecture, so many people are listening. But we'll put down together a nice bundle of documents and proceed to court. And we have done that. And I'll have you know that on 4th of April, we won a petition in Migori. That's uh, for whoever would like to listen. It's petition number 8 of 2021, where four victims had been shot severally during the repeat elections in 2017 so we have had a track record of winning but then the question is do we get compensation for these particular people yeah. you see it's clear to me when it's physical gunshot wound maybe Psycholo there's an injury and all psychologically how psychological it, it has been it's still very hard i mean our jurisprudence hasn't moved to that level if you look at the um, let's say in america we've had people who've been compensated for psychological Torture. Trauma. Mm -hmm. The trauma they have suffered. And and the truth is, in as much as maybe our laws or our courts have not pronounced themselves on this particular aspect of, of torture, is that what you carry and what, I mean, medics argue to be lifelong is the psychological effects of torture. Um, with, with maybe a gunshot wound, sometimes you may heal. If your skin is really nice, you may mm -hmm. heal. Yeah. So you may not carry it, but... but after that, you, you'll hear people talking about anxiety, yep. hypervigilance, and all those things. But we still don't have a judgment that actually compensates people for the psychological, psychological effects of torture. But what we have, Latif, is punitive damages. And we have had at least, in one case, sometime in 2021 January, we received up to three... 3 million in terms of punitive damage. But in terms of psychological, we still don't have it. There's a school that is headed by... Uh, one doctor smoking one jala. They help retrain, re-educate, resensitize people who have studied what you learn at French study. The Judiciary Training Institute. Uh, that's the one I was speaking of. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Now, this school, in its curriculum, do they have units of psychology? But if they don't, in when you are undertaking your legal studies, do you have units of psychology that you study? And if so, how many? <laughs> and if so, do you even remember them? 
<laughs> oh wow, this is interesting. I may not firmly speak on the particular school that we we are discussing here with respect to the units that they have, but every human rights practitioner, especially in in the torture space, has gone through some form of trauma competency training. And I mean, IMLU offers that. International Justice Mission offers that, and there are other other partners who offer those small trainings. And I call them small specifically because we do not have a proper a curriculum that will train lawyers, maybe um, advocacy officers, officers, judicial officers. Police. Yeah, and, and it's the small things like if a witness just starts being very broody and sad and upset uh, before, you know, a court session, do you just say, ah, this is a, this is a difficult witness? Mm. She's my star witness, but very difficult. If you're trauma competent and you've been trained and you, you remember your psychology, you would know, you know, yes. oh my good, this person is anxious. Yeah. So what we still do now is if I go to court, I will be with our psycholo psychological lead or a counselor. Always. In fact, if you go into a room of at least three, four victims of torture, you have to go with a counselor. You must, mm. yeah, because there are certain things I won't see, and not because I'm nascent, it's just because I don't have the training, or maybe I just don't have the know how. So they, they don't teach this in law school, yeah? Um, no. well, not in my law school. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not take a break. In my law school. <laughs> Let's take a break. 27 minutes to 10. Isabella Obara is a technical lead for litigation and legal advice at the Independent Medical Legal Unit. Today, we are talking about torture and reparations for victims of torture. We'll hear what IMLU has been doing and what it's doing and what we need to know about torture. In fact, if you have an issue and you need to raise it also, how can you reach out to IMLU so that they can support you? We'll be back shortly after we take a look at the weather and traffic, plus some business news. This is The Situation Room, the only way to start your day. Good morning, and I love your show. Thank you. <laughs> Having come from a Kikuyu radio background, I migrated to Spice hmm. <laughs> because of the content. I was born in a slum, but somehow I got a break in life. So sometimes when you see the sweating coming out because of the passion and whatever it is, <laughs> <laughs> behind the noise, there are people, and we share the same umbilical cord. It shouldn't be like that. I am so disappointed. We used to tell Honda uh, Boraila Molotinga that he's doing police of conmanship. And even President Uhuru Kenyatta, Sirikali, he is going to conmanship you. You cannot promise people that you reduce tax, then you double. In politics, mm. there is uh, the issue of trust. Mm. For you to turn around and then stab the same people who gave you that trust, there is no other level of dishonesty. And I imabo, utaona dunia tu. The situation bro. Kenya's biggest uh, conversation. Conditions are 17 in Nairobi. We'll see highs of 23. Highs of 25 through Tuesday in Nakuru and highs of 22 in a cloudy Nyeri. Highs will go to 24 in a sunny Eldoret and 25, rather 28 in a sunny Mombasa. The sun is up in Malindi. We'll see highs of 29 and Kisumu will see highs of 29 today. Kakamega will see highs of 28. It's partly sunny, going to highs of 27 in Kampala and 30 in Dar es Salaam. Nine degrees currently in, Zala, in Johannesburg, going to highs of 17. And mostly cloudy conditions in Lagos will see highs of 30. Sunny in Kinshasa will see highs of 30 as well. 38 will be the high as Beijing goes into evening. And coming into morning, it's going to go to highs of 25 in Paris and 23 in London. New York, when they come into Tuesday, will see highs of 25. up your life. I haven't had too much of a challenge with traffic this Tuesday, so that's a good thing. Uh, we're just seeing the last bits of it coming off of the thicker superhighway right around Pangani. That underpass will do it to you, but you'll be okay then getting onto Moranga Road. Uh, we're seeing a little bit of it left on Juja Road still, but that's fine. Gong Road has um, whittled away as has whatever was coming off of Kiambu Road today. Also looking at... Um, Coming off of Magadi Road today, that'll slow you down a little bit. But as you get to the junction, just that Bomas opposite, you'll be all right. Traffic hour is over for today. Talk to us through the morning. Spice FMKE on Twitter. Business News with Spice FM.
This is The Business. I'm Lea Ubaga. Kenya is now relying heavily on expensive sugar imports from neighboring Uganda after India imposed export restrictions on the sweetener in what is set to sustain higher consumer prices. Data from the Sugar Directorate shows 68% of the 21,887 tons of table sugar that Kenya imported in May came from Uganda, while shipment from India, which was the previous month's leading source for the commodity, declined to 24%. Ugandan sugar Sugar was expensive by 43% at 117,848 a ton compared to India's 66,324 a ton. The Treasury has raised the domestic borrowing target for the current financial year by 50 billion shillings, backpedaling on a previous cut effected in the first mini-budget release by the Kenya Kwanzaa administration. The latest estimates of revenue grants and loans for the financial year 2023-2024 show the Treasury now targets 475 billion shillings from the domestic market in the current financial year, up from the 425.1 billion shillings prescribed in the supplementary budget tabled earlier in the year. In June 2022, the borrowing target for the current financial year as prescribed by the Jubilee government was set at 579.1 billion shillings before supplementary budget 1 2022-2023 under the Ruta administration revised it downward by 26.6% to 425.1 billion shillings amid a push for aggressive fiscal consolidation by the new administration. That's the business news. I'm Lea Obaga. Spice FM Business. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. All right. Mornings done right. 94.4. Spice FM. From the Independent Medical Legal Unit is our guest, City. You know the. Uh, subject of torture it doesn't matter how you twist it's always a difficult one always yes yeah. because our reference point here is human beings and you wonder why it's absolutely necessary even for it to take place but even more so when we talk about a unit within our community as Kenyans whose main function is supposed to be protecting lives and yet every time we talk about loss of lives, they seem to be at the center of that discussion. Right. And not necessarily for protecting it, but for causing the harm. Mm. The reason why I ask the question about uh, psychology <laughs> is for a very simple reason. You right. see, the, this is a discussion we always have. How long does one train before they become a policeman? How many months? Is it six or seven? Mm. Mm. Or is it nine months? It's nine months at Kidani. Okay, now you tell me. How many months, how many years does one study before they qualify to do most jobs? At least four years plus. Yes, two, three years. Now you tell me, isn't there a bit of a problem here? Because there is. Yes. There is. You want someone to have this onerous task of having to oversee security. And then you train them for nine months. And to add salt to injury is mm. you're only training them on the difference between a lethal and non-lethal weapon, which to me is a misnomer because there's no non-lethal weapon. Mm. So mm. you're only training them on tools. Mm. That's all. And you're, order. Yeah. And mm. how to follow mm. order. And w- uh, Yeah. Mm. Just taking orders and mm. tools. Mm. Lethal tools. Yes. Do you know how... Look, look at other disciplines that. But that's the basic training of a police officer. Let's also remember that, right? At the yes. entry level. Right. Of, it's like first year of <laughs> college, right? right? And then for you to move above that, at least after serving five years, now mm. to move to the level where you get like a corporal mark, mm. you have to go back for training. Mm. It's true, but you see, you are unleashed into the unsuspecting world of, of individuals with this nine months training. That's my problem. Mm. A first year, you're not doing anything, you're just studying. If you're a teacher, the best thing that happens, you go for teacher training. Mm. Or, I mean, uh, teaching practice. Teaching practice. That's what happens. I suppose it's the same like if you are a doctor and you do one year, then you're set into the into the <laughs> into the population yeah. and then you say, Okay, after two years come back, we train you again. Because you're actually we, doing the work. Actually when medical you're there. school is different. Yeah. Yeah. I mean just as an alude, even yes. a lawyer a yes. law school or whatever it is. The, you know yeah. I say it's you different. can do triage after first year. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, you the, can. You can. A lot of the training is actually practical. Mm. 
And that's why you move from Chiromo and come to whichever campus where the athlete, you, you actually interact Spend with the time. patient. Mm. Training yes. is important. So, so can I ask a question? Yeah. Yes. From the incidences of torture that we see in the country, what is the highest percentage of perpetrators of torture? Well, um, and this is looking at the statistics we Not have. Not even numbers, but mm. in terms percentage. of topography, who? It's the National Police Service for sure. Okay. Now, based on that, would you, in this definition, is torture premed? Is it premeditated? I wouldn't say it's premeditated. Okay. So it's something that happens on the fly. Would you say that? That in an instant when something is happening, because you've thought somebody's arm was shot off, it's happening in a situation where there's some kind of aggravation. It's happening in a situation where maybe if other things and other factors had been balanced, that particular incident would not have taken place. Would you Would you say that? Um, those options are, are a bit limiting, if you ask me, yeah. because it, it's it's the structure. It's the structure that defeats everything, mm -hmm. really, because if you're trained and the only thing you know is you shoot to kill. Okay. Or you cane. Mm -hmm. To harm. To harm. Yes. In fact, you cane to maim. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do, do you think we would even talk about premeditated? Is there any thought? This is a program now. Okay. So what you're saying then is that it is systemic it in is nature. It is systemic. Right? So anybody who's coming, so it doesn't matter then if you were trained for nine months or ten years. You're saying that you've gone into a system which almost expects you without saying, without saying, mm. Obara, you will behave like this. Mm -hmm. Without using the words. But it is assumed that this is what you are going to do. This is what is expected Ex of you. This right? is what is expected of you. Right. And in fact, if you deviate, you look like an outlier. So, the, that person then who, 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 who commits this act, are they, a vi are they not a victim as well? <laughs> <laughs> you caught me right there. I wouldn't say they're victims, really and truly, because they suffer no harm whatsoever. Oh, oh men? Are you kidding me? No, 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 no. Uh, L look, <laughs> but but who 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 is harming them? Is it a public officer in official capacity? It's who the, is harming is them? The ecosystem they the, they, are they have been introduced into. into. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Fair enough. Mm. Uh, fair enough. I'll give you that because then. If, if, I, if I look at it in a different light, I'd be discrediting even the amount of work that IMLO has done. There's mm. been an enormous amount of work that has uh, gone into collaborating with these public offi officers mm. in terms of training and retraining them, mm. especially at the community level and sometimes even at those high-ranking spaces where we talk about trauma. Mm -hmm. Yeah, How is it that they even debrief? Yeah, in their own small spaces. Sure. And and you know that there are certain structures that obviously as a civil society we cannot, you know, go over go over and above, mm -hmm. but we have made the effort. We have at least even talked to them and even trained them and even opened up spaces for discussion, mm -hmm. especially in terms of debriefing, mm -hmm. the importance of debriefing, how is it that they relate with each other? Because I know they already have the systems in place in terms of who debriefs them and mm -hmm. how they do it. But you see if you're going to be debriefing with your senior, is that debriefing? Because maybe they could be your stressors, right? Mm. Yeah, because I'm it's thinking, even as you say that, I'm thinking of this very famous movie, oh, is that guy's name when he was asked, Jack, Jack Nicholson, mm. you can't handle the truth. And it, it came out to be that these people under him who were doing the act, again, a systemic thing, doing because the act, and in a court of a law, a few good men, a few good men, mm. exactly, and in a court of law, mm. he spoke the words that these people were acting under his instruction, under the system. So it was not these four men, corporals then, yeah. who were put under the, under the gallows. Yeah. It was then him who was going to then take mm. culpability mm. or assume culpability because of this murder or this torture mm. that happened. And this is what I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get at. Because it must be a very difficult position then for you where somebody is wielding a weapon doesn't intend to see person X on the street and say, I have anything personal against them. But I know that any moving target, my job is to shoot, yeah. kill. shoot to kill. Sometimes shoot even I don't know this person is not personal. Yep. Yeah. Somebody's told me to do it. Yeah. I don't know this individual. I don't know that you've gone down your this flat to job. get airtime. Mm -hmm. I don't know who you are, yeah. but this is my job. 
So should mm-hmm. we be going for these individuals mm. or should we be going for a system change? Obviously, obviously, um, it, when the way we've been discussing is we've been looking at the direct service provision, what we do, the legal, the medical documentation. But there has to be a system change, to be quite honest, because that's, that's the hardware. That, that's the hardware that we're dealing with. System change starts at the policy level. But you see, every time you're speaking about torture, you, if you go, uh, if we only talk about the policy or the system change, the one who's seeking reparations doesn't even hear you because it's already happened. So, so what we're talking about with your question mm. is the preventative aspect of torture. Mm. What we were talking about with reparations is now the responsive. It has happened. And, uh, yes, and now we are moving from responding. We really don't want to respond. It's expensive, it's mm. tedious, it's painful, mm. it's horrendous. Mm. What you're talking about is the policy level. Can we look at the data that we have? I mean, we have a very nice place to start from. We have a beautiful template, the TGRC report um, handed to the president in 2013, Mm. sometime in April. You have everything set for you. They have investigated, they have picked over 40,000 statements and, and, and confessions and whatever. And they have put together something so nice that tells you this is where there's a policy gap. This is the system change we expect. They've even given you the person responsible and the time frame. But have we seen anything? Yeah. We still don't see much. I mean, we obviously keep doing the job and we have seen some, you know, few uh, steps being taken. But they're very trepid steps. Right. Very trepid steps. What would it take then to see more? Usually they say that if you see one big fish going down and then it acts <laughs> as deterrent for anybody else who might think that they can perpetuate the system. Would that be the same thing here? <sighs> I'd like, uh, l- let, me, let me answer your question, though, this way, yeah. that we have areas where we're seeing improvement and we have areas that we're still regressing. And my assertion where we are regressing is that we have still institutionalized torture yeah. in a way. So if we have it institutionalized and structured, we're still funding it. Mm. And the moment, it's the same mm. thing, we disbanded SSU sometime in November, and I'll tell you, free of charge, and you can quote me, <laughs> is that we'll have it in another outfit soon. If not, yeah, it's like if, not in yeah. if not already. If not already. Yes, if not You're already. Right. And SARS in Nigeria just took all those officers, disbanded and Look. disbanded mm-hmm. SARS, and, and now then we have them. A different outfit. Yeah. So that's that's the thing with with the policy. And so sometimes we want to bury our hand, our heads in the sun and say, oh, but we already did. If it's good on paper, it does nothing for anyone. Mm. You have someone who lost their arm at 17, they're now 30. You have not paid the amounts of money. Someone was shot on the jaw mm. and they fell down and now they cannot speak properly, they cannot feed. What do we do for, for people like that? Yep. Mm. What do we do for people like that? So we have regressed in other areas, but we have made progress. Let me give you a beautiful example. We have the Mavoko 3 judgment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm. Opens up more space to discuss issues of forensic documentation. We look at geospatial engineering in questions of the law and how we even pick this particular evidence. We have the judgment we received as in law uh, sometime for, for Migori. They're speaking of the positive obligation that the state has in terms of, you know, ensuring that this person is safe, investigating, and issuing a continuous update and report to these people. So there are spaces where we are moving, but for how long will we just say that we are moving on paper? We have to have these 30 million Kenya shillings, 100 plus million owed to victims who have been compensated or rather have received um, declarations of violations in court. We have to see that they get their money. Mm. Those ones who need corrective surgery, let's see that. For, I mean, for argument's sake, the people who are are supposed to be compensated based on the TGRC report, it's more than 10 years now. Have we done anything for them? Even the, the basic apology that yeah, was supposed to yeah. be given, it hasn't been done. So we are progressing academically and practically. We are, so what that? do we need to do? What we need to do from this point <coughs> onwards is we must prioritize torture. We have deprioritized torture for the longest time ever. It's because we continue using it as a tool to repress opponents, to repress people who are questioning power, to even just deter people from seeking justice. We must prioritize torture moving forward we have to start hearing discussions of torture in corporate and ent- from corporate entities right. we must start seeing uh, politicians actually taking it very seriously 
yeah we have to start seeing development partners now prioritizing it in every strategic intervention torture is now not just something we we will keep kiki kakaing about because we've done that from 1963 mm. up until now that's the first thing that we need to do because if we prioritize it we'll start funding interventions that work around it we'll start capacity building national police service officers state of or rather even officers like myself city was asking about psychology and mm. trauma competencies there are actually things we can do and i know we have everything readily available mm. to prioritize torture what do we need for that political goodwill P political goodwill is everything Okay. Because a civil society, if we don't have political goodwill mm -hmm. or um, the space and enabling environment to operate, mm -hmm. wh what will you do? You'll pull out all our certificates and How tax exemptions. How different would this be packaged? I'm looking at this era after Kanu left office and we had NAC. Mm -hmm. And all those people who had been tortured and all and were coming into government. You know, we had the Wanyeriki Horrors. We had a justice minister who had worked with many victims of torture in the Nyayo torture chambers and all. Uh, he did not move. We, right. had, uh, surgical we had cases system, system of those people, mm. cases of those people that have gone to court and they've actually been found, yes, these people were tortured yes. and the government ought to compensate them. Still right? not compensated. Still not compensated. Hundreds of millions. We have had a Some chief justice who is a, one of the foremost human rights defenders <laughs> that this country has ever produced. He has sat as a chief justice, served an entire term, mm. while voluntarily retired early, but still nothing. So what else do we need to do now? And the current Chief Justice has yes. CV, has the sort of work you're doing under her belt as well. Exactly. Mm. Mm. What people we refer to as civil what society. What more do we So everybody's in place. How come there's no, <laughs> <laughs> there, there's no movement? Well, there is movement, but <coughs> it's subterranean. We don't see it clearly. So perhaps mm. you ought to tell us what it is that is actually happening in that space. Because we, our lived experience is that it's not easy to see the movement. But I sense there is movement. Well, you're, sen you're actually sensing right, uh, especially because you have to see justice to be done and not just hear about it, mm. not just hear about it. Um, first, I, this is now as a professional, and I may not speak for the judiciary or, or whatever, but I just feel like there are certain things that we can do immediately, not the far-fetched stuff, for for us to see that we are actually reparating these victims. Let's start. If there's any amount that is being owed, what's so hard for it to be actualized? Because there are people who are being owed from as far back as, I'm looking at some of our clients, as far back as 1996. <laughs> They've never received the amounts up to date. Mm. Can we at least do that? Let's start from there. Um, and maybe, for instance, some of the treaties that we've not ratified up until today, and we have had continuous recommendations, are we able to do that? There are things that we can do that we are not doing. Let's, for instance, look at the cases that have been in court for over we are still in court for um, the Kingongo massacre uh, families mm -hmm. from 2000. It's 2023. Can we at least prioritize these cases and make sure that they're not part of the backlog that we still have? Yeah, there are things that can be done. We are just not doing them. You know, there's this subject of trauma and the effect of it. Huh? One doesn't just see it. When you live in a unit that you think is supposed to be an accommodation, which is just slightly worse than a pigsty. That is where most many policemen live in. It's traumatic living there. When a, a really tired looking bed sheet is the wall between you and your neighbor, that is a trauma. When you have vehicles that can't move because you don't have fuel and yet you've received a call and you're supposed to go out to ensure that you conduct whatever it is you're supposed to conduct to provide the, serv the, the security service. This thing is perhaps more evident when you look at the police service. But if you look at our civil service and if you look at how it is we have structured the service delivery within the various disciplines, you will find that very many people work in traumatic situations. Mm. Teachers not excluded. Yeah. Doctors not excluded. Yes. Yeah. I'm yeah. picking on this. So yeah. you find yeah. that the mindset that we have is born out of this trauma. And how it manifests in this country is how we trivialize and make light of very serious issues. It's relief. Mm. It's our coping mechanism. Mm-hmm. 
And the reason why we're so good at it is because there is a lot of it. So unless you find a way of finding relief, whether it's comic or otherwise, you'll probably go mad. Now, your profession has a very big role because it's you people who understand these laws that are supposed to be the lamppost and the guide and the pathway and the light that shines on our path as we move along. So I'm simply saying your work is cut out because it, it is not simple. <laughs> I, <clears throat> I'm just listening to you and being that a human, I, I am a human rights practitioner, I would be tempted to just say, no, 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 no. It's just for the victims, for the victims, for the victims. But I'd have you know that we've also come into close contact with police officers who've been tortured, mm. sometimes by their own or some other facets of, you know, officers from the public service. So it's not just, it's not just victims. And when I, the moment we say that you are due for reparation, we are not saying that you can't be a public officer because we also have public officers in our, in our particular registry or files or whatever. I, I speak for everyone. But now in terms of the conditions in which we work in, I mean, I'm not a state officer, so I'm not able to speak firmly ten toes on that. But then the thing with reparations is that once you are a victim, we don't try to say, oh, maybe they were a former state officer, maybe mm. now they're not. If you're a victim, you're a victim. I could be one, you could be one. Fine, our, our work is cut out for us. But then again, we play just a very small role around this, right? Mm. Because there are other people who bring everything together. So if you're telling me that all I need is just to go to court and go to court and go to court. What happens to these other things that need to be done for us to see reparations? There are so many other key players. We have investigators who are also, again, police officers, and we have good ones for that matter. And yeah. I mean, some are, So, fine, my work is cut out, but everyone's work is cut out. around torture is cut out. You, as a person who gets to sit on this particular platform and speak to one million people, your work is cut out, too. You get to understand torture. Are you just a million? That's what I was wondering. <laughs> Did, did I? Did I? So torture. let's say ten, <laughs> ten million. Is it ten million? So, city, respectfully, your work is also cut out. You can speak about torture every other place you go to. You have a voice. Your, people see you highly, and they hold you to regard. And, and if you spoke and said this is this is not right, they will actually see that it's not right. When we see these memes going around, I saw a meme where a police officer was hit by another person, and it was the funniest meme apparently. Mm. And, and it kept going do, around. Do you know why? Tell me why. Puagu kupata puaguz. Yes, exactly. Latin. You know, the yeah. shoes on the other foot. Or City, you no. The, the button. You see, the very point I'm making, for it to be humorous, mm. this very public is also traumatized. You see, trauma, trauma is an interesting thing, and the way it manifests itself. Yeah. You only need to see people who've grown up in homes that are abusive to understand it. Right. Because the very things that they see will manifest in their lives when they're adults. And some of them may not even understand why it is they're behaving the way they're behaving. This warrants a totally different discussion because you're on to something. Um, we have people who've experienced adverse childhood trauma. I mean, and I digress just so I can explain and maybe flesh out your point. Um, the things that seem very normal to us. If you are being hit as a person, now you're in the service, I mm. could hit you just a little bit. Mm. I mean, I'm just trying to get you to move to, move. to another place, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm just getting you to... So my thing is, with that, that warrants a whole different discussion. We'd be happy to bring our psychological lead here to discuss Please with you that. Please do. When? Let's yes, talk about it. We are this. happy yeah. to do that. They tell you more <laughs> around that. The way we are socialized, the environments we grow in, and how it and then how manifests. And how that affects us. Yeah. Isabella. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Thank today. you, Latif. And all the best. Yes, all our cut, our jobs are cut out. Mm. So mm. Yes. We take that. Asante. Isabella Obara is a technical lead, a litigation and legal advisor at the Independent Medical Legal Unit. Thank you for joining us. And Wangari, thank you very much for surviving thank the four hours. Had a great time. Well done. Come back again soon. I will. And Isabella, you'll also be welcome soon be as a guest host. I'll take you up on that offer. Very you. good. Thank you for tuning in to Kenya's biggest conversation. Have a lovely one. It's 10 a.m. Good morning, this is the Newswire. I'm Lea Ubaga. National Assembly Minority Leader Opio Andai has told the Kenya Kwanzaa government to prepare for serious 